Hello world, good morning, namaste, and Nisam Bulavinaka from Sydney, Australia. I am Sashi Singh, and welcome once again to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Today is, of course, episode 31. We will shortly meet our chief guest, Mr. Nirmal Singh Chima, a one-time librarian, then the public political affairs specialist with the American Embassy in Suva, a former past national president of the Fiji JCs, and now a successful management consultant. We will discuss with Mr. Nirmal Singh Chima why he feels Fiji has failed to continue to be the leader in the Pacific and has destroyed the Pacific way and regional solidarity, why he is so vocal about reforming the Fiji military forces and the foreign policy considerations in closing the Fiji diplomatic mission in the USA, and what that decision means to Fiji. All that, and a lot more questions on things that really matters to Fijians, today with our chief guest. And I hope wherever you are watching from, you are all well settled in, to enjoy what promises to be an enlightening interview with my chief guest. As always, may I please request that you share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that we may share the interview with Mr. Nirmal Singh Jima with as many interested people as possible. And to ensure that you receive instant notifications of all future programs, please like the SSTP page and follow us too. You'll never miss out on information. Welcome to the Thinking People's Program, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, live on Facebook and on YouTube. Well, right now that you've all settled in, it's uh, time to see what are the key happenings of the week, the political week in Fiji and in Australia. A very big welcome to our regular contributor, Nikhil Singh. Nikhil, welcome to episode 31 of SSTP. Hope you're feeling well. Uh, good to be with you. It'd be good to be with you, Sashi. Uh, just a nasty winter virus, but slowly, uh, slowly but surely, we're getting out of it. I'm glad uh, you've made the show today. Uh, I thought earlier in the week that uh, uh, you weren't well. So welcome, Nikhil. Welcome again. So let's get straight into your segment. Uh, some major news in the political arena. Two opposition parties in Fiji have been referred to the Fiji Independent Commission Against Corruption, FICAC, while the Fiji Elections Office decides on whether to refer a third one. What do you have for us on this front? Well, it's actually the National Federation Party is the first cab of the, of the rank, so to speak. Uh, the party has been referred to FICAC for an alleged breach of Section 144A of the Electoral Act. Last month, the Supervisor of Elections, Mohamed Sinim, had issued a notice to the NFP to remove a video from the NFP Facebook page which allegedly contained false information. The supervisor of elections had given NFP a deadline to comply and they failed to do so according to the supervisor of elections and as such, the breach has now been referred to FICA for its necessary actions. Now, such on Friday, the Fiji Labour Party was also referred to FICA by the elections office or the supervisor of elections. Uh, Salim says they found that at a campaign event a representative of the party allegedly made several statements that may be in direct breach of the law. He said a video recording of the political rally uh, at the FLP held at Korobuto and Nendi last month has surfaced on Facebook uh, by one of the FLP's representatives, allegedly containing statements made by supporters, which may also amount to racial vilification. And yesterday, Sashi, we learned that the People's Alliance is potentially facing a referral to FICEC over alleged racist statement posted on social media by one of the provisional candidates. Um, the Fijian Elections Office says they will evaluate um, the contents of the article and decide whether it needs to be referred to FICEC, Sashi. Well, the way it's going, I wonder how many political parties will 
remain by the time elections happens. Moving on from the opposition parties being referred to FICAC to claims of police intimidation and harassment at political gatherings, the Electoral Commission says there is no case to answer. Tell us more, please, Nikhil. Well, the Fiji Labour Party, Mahendra Chaudhary, uh, Fiji Labour Party leader Mahendra Chaudhary, has alleged that in two separate incidents last month, CID officers from Suva showed up in the West asking questions about these Labour meetings and rallies. Chaudhary said, and I quote, this is nothing but intim- intimidation and I'm calling on the Commission of Police to stop such fear tactics. As far as I'm concerned, there is no basis or justification for such unprofessional behaviour. This is not only abuse of office and authority, it is also unlawful under the Electoral Act for anyone, including police officers, to interfere in campaign activities of political parties. Now, Chaudhry had written to the chairman of the uh, Electoral Commission as he saw the alleged intimidation and harassment by the police as um, a breach of the Electoral Act. Uh, The Electoral Commission moved with lightning speed, if you like, Sashi, and has dismissed the Fiji Labour Party complaint saying the police force is well within its powers to conduct investigations. And Suva lawyer Richard Naidu was back in court last week. What is the update on the contempt of court proceedings filed against him by the Attorney General? Uh, As reported in the Fiji Times, Richard Naidu's defence team has questioned the motive behind this contempt of court proceedings. Uh, Defence lawyer John Apted asked, and I quote, what did the Attorney General do to protect the courts in the four months between Richard Naidu's, Richard Naidu's alleged contemptuous Facebook post and the filing of the contempt of court proceedings against him? Mr. Eptid said it was very difficult to see how the allegedly contemptuous Facebook post, which made reference to two small typo, typographical errors in a humorous way and referenced government's vaccination campaign, lowered the repetition of the courts. Uh, John Apted said his client's application to set aside the proceedings contended that they were brought because Mr. Naidu was a critic and political rival of Sayyid Kayum. Mr. Naidu is a, has applied to set aside the contempt uh, proceedings. He is applying for orders to cross-examine uh, Aya Sayyid Kayum as part of his application and that there be, and that there be a full he- oral hearing on the application um, the matter will be called on the 1st of September for a ruling on Mr. Naidu's application, Sashi. Prime Minister Frank Bani Marama has made some indication on when the country will go to the polls. Does this now put an end to all the speculation? I don't think uh, the Prime Minister's comments will put an end to the speculation, Sashi, especially when he has not given any clues about the dates or even the month. Um, Prime Minister Badi Marama says the national general election will be held this year and will not spill into 2023. Uh, Now, he's made the comments while speaking with members of the Fijian diaspora at a Talanoa session uh, in San Francisco last week, Sashi. Yeah, I watched that on video as well. Interesting indeed uh, how it was conducted. Anyway, Nikhil, in recent months, we've seen the rising cost of living pressures Adding to the woes of the less fortunate in Fiji, the cost of some essentials has skyrocketed. We have a heartbreaking story on how people are coping. Please tell us more on that. Yes, Sashi, I've covered many stories in my previous profession, but nothing as dire as this. Uh, uh, This is indeed heartbreaking. Um, I've picked up this story from the Fiji Times, uh, which reported that... uh, Uh, Soaring milk product prices is forcing mothers and carers of infants and young children to resort to gruel, uh, which is a thin liquid boiled food made from cassava and other crops. Um, They had interviewed Lorraine Nalatikau, a mother of five children. Uh, She said over the past few years, cost of nearly all food items had increased to a point that that required careful budgeting. She said, and I quote, for my one-year-old daughter, I always use rewa powder milk. When she was six months, I was giving her SMA baby formula, but when she turned a year old, I started to give her powdered milk because everything started to increase so much that we couldn't afford formula anymore. 
Uh, Melati Cow said two packets of the 450 grams Rewa full cream milk at $7.95. Each were purchased weekly for a young daughter alone. A packet of red cow powdered milk is being retailed at between $9 to $10 at stores around the country. Now, on the day she was uh, interviewed, uh, she said this, uh, Sashia quote, This morning, I grated some cassava and made it for Lolo. I didn't use powdered milk, but scraped coconut instead and gave it to her, her being her little um, daughter, Sashi. So uh, she went to say, so I only give powdered milk to my daughter when it's near her nap time. So certainly a heartbreaking story, Sashi, the reality is on the ground. Yes, uh, a lot of people are on Struggle Street and uh, there's no end in sight. And it's just a matter of time as to uh, when someone has to take stock and make a, a big call. Closer to home here in Australia, you had shared last week that the race was on for the deputy premier role in the Dominic Parite government following the resignation of New York trade job saga and royal Se uh, senior liberal minister and deputy premier Stuart Ayres. Do we have a new deputy premier yet? A, a quick report on this, Sashi. Yes, we do. Treasurer Matt Keane has been elected as the uh, New South Wales Liberals' uh, new deputy leader, and he, of course, takes on the reign of deputy premier. He was elected uh, unopposed in the party room meeting last week. All right, and sticking with politics in New South Wales, as the New South Wales Premier tries hard to shake off this New York trade job debacle, there appears to be more trouble on the horizon involving his former Deputy Premier and former Fair Trading Minister. What's happening there, Nikhil? Well, information is now surfacing that uh, the former Deputy Premier, John Berlaro, met with the then Fair Trading Minister, Eleni Petonos, weeks before a building ban was lifted for the developer for whom he has been working since leaving parliament. Now, Patino says that the um, lifting of the stop work order had nothing to do with her and was a decision made by the Office of the Building Commissioner. New South Wales Building Commissioner David Chandler abruptly uh, quit his uh, role in late July, telling the public he thought the time was right for a reset. The opposition is using this issue to continue the pressure on the already troubled Paraday government they now want to see Mr. Chandler's resignation letter after reports uh, about his relationship with Petinos had, uh, had um, uh, soured. All right, and to some federal news now before you sign up for this week, state and territory education ministers were in Canberra last week. What brought them to the nation's capital? Well, this was initiated by the federal education minister, Jason Clare, as the nation continues to suffer from teacher shortages, uh, Shashi. Um, so what did they do in Canberra? Education ministers have agreed to a national plan to consider better pathways into teaching, new pay structures, and a decreased workload as means to combat the teacher shortage. After the meeting in Canberra on Friday, uh, state and territory ministers said uh, the new federal education minister, Jason Clare, offered a, a quote, breath of fresh air. So that's uh, the latest from Canberra, Sashi. All right, Nikhil. Well, thank you very much for your contribution today. As always, nicely presented. Look forward to seeing you uh, in the next program. Uh, take it easy, rest up, and get well soon. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you once again to Nikhil Singh. And you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live as well as on YouTube Live. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. Fijians want to know. Please like and follow the SSTP page if you have not done so. I have an important announcement to share with our viewers. Sashi Singh's talking point, SSTP, recognizes that questions, rather questioning, constructive arguments, and opinions are part of conversation, but posts with aggressive, personal attacks, profanity, name-calling, swearing, defamatory in nature and or threatening will be removed immediately and offenders will be blocked from being a part of the SSTP program permanently. So let's observe these rules and enjoy the program. Once again, to all our viewers watching today, 
Thank you very much for tuning in to SSTP. Today, of course, episode 31. Now it is time to meet our chief guest in today's program. Our chief guest today is a librarian who then went on to become the public political affairs specialist with the American Embassy in Suva, specializing in media relations, creating positive visibility for the embassy in all sectors of the Fijian and Pacific Island communities. Besides his public affairs role, he was also responsible for political and commercial investment affairs. Nirmal Singh Chima has worked for five different U.S. ambassadors and has received excellent recommendations for his service to the people and the government of the United States of America. He has been honored with seven meritorious honor awards and one superior honor award by the Department of State and has received several other awards for his work. Our chief guest is also the past national president of the Fiji JCs and a past member of the Rotary Club. He has spoken in forums like the United Nations and is a JC certified trainer in leadership skills and communications. Today, he is a successful management consultant and is well known for expressing his views on the politics of the land on his Facebook profile. It is now my pleasure to welcome on SSTP our chief guest, Mr. Nirmal Singh Chima. Good morning to you, Mr. Chima. Welcome and Sasriya Kal to you. Good morning, Sasriya Kal Sashi. Well, it's a pleasure having you on the show. I've been reading your posts on Facebook for quite a while, and uh, some of the statements that you have posted grows straight to the heart. And um, I believe sometimes you don't tolerate nonsense. You call a spade a spade the way you see it. I'll explore more of uh, you and what you stand for in a while. But as I always do, let's begin at the beginning. Um, Please, um, for our viewing audience who might not really know who Nirmal Singh Chima is, let me start by finding out a lot more about you. What sort of background uh, did you come from and where were you born? Uh, I was born in Singatoka, Shashi. I come from a sugarcane farming background. And I am a proud uh, uh, cane farmer. Uh, my parents struggled a lot. You know, the values that I got on the farm, of the hard work, my, the sacrifices my parents uh, made to make me what I am today is something very dear to me. And it's a reflection of myself. And this is what I'm trying to install in my children, instill in my children as well. So, yes, I would like to identify as a son of a sugarcane farmer hailing from Nandronga. All right. Uh, wonderful background. Those people who are farmers, they, well, in Australia, for instance, they're the backbone of the country. And uh, I've seen your photos on your farm uh, doing quite well. So, in terms of your mom and dad, uh, they're also from a farming background in Singatoga. Yes, they, we were sugarcane farmers. My grandfather was a sugarcane farmer. My father was a sugarcane farmer. I did a little bit of sugarcane farming and then started working and then went back, you know, with my you know, retirement age approaching. I think I'm a sick and I must go back and twill the soil. And that's what I have started uh, besides running my own business here. You, you mentioned Sikh. You're, you're a Sikh uh, from that uh, faith. Does yes. the turban color that you're wearing today, does that have... A significance. Uh, you know, uh, Shashi, in the morning when I woke up, I had a blue turban. This I was deciding where to wear a blue turban or to orange. Mm-hmm. Uh, blue turban uh, for us is, uh, in the, you know, is resemblance of uh, Oria. You know, a Oria wears a blue turban. Mm-hmm. And um, the orange t- turban uh, signifies wisdom. So, you know, I thought in early in the morning, I went to uh, Gurudwara and took my, I wore a red turban. But I took my orange turban and uh, placed it under the, you know, uh, near the Guru Granth Sahib and asked uh, Wahai Guruji to bless me with wisdom so that when I speak to you today, I don't speak to you as a warrior, but not try to uh, apply wisdom uh, in what in the currently we are going through in our country. All so right. orange well is wisdom. And I hope I can, you know, dispart some wisdom today. Well, we certainly look forward to the wisdom that you'll share with us on SSTP. 
Nirmal, in terms of education, what, uh, uh, where were you educated? Uh, you know, I, um, I, uh, I just had my education up to secondary school. I did a little bit in librarianship, but that's where my education ends. But uh, my real, uh, uh, you know, coming into the public life was being a member of Fiji JCs that gave me an opportunity to speak uh, to build confidence, to be very vocal about things. So that's how I started developing myself. And as you said, I was a librarian and from a librarian to become a political and public affairs specialist and to rise to become one of the most senior local employees of a very large diplomatic mission here. I think it was an achievement and it was my self-confidence, my training in JCs and our history of political affiliations of our past generation. Okay, and uh, who would you say was the earliest influence in your life? Well, you know, uh, politics run into our family. My dada, you know, my uncle Naveen Maharaj's father, uh, Ramchandra Maharaj, was one of the three members of uh, Indian members of the Legislative Council. And as you know, later on, uh, Naveen Maharaj became the Lord Mayor of uh, Suva and uh, was the Minister for Trade and Commerce in Bhavandra government. So this gen this generation, I am carrying that torch, uh, Sashi. Okay, and uh, what would you say is your earliest memory? Memory with in, at the U.S. Embassy or no, 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 no. Yeah. Just Nirmal Singh Chima. If I asked you, oh, to... my earliest memory, you know, uh, it's uh, quite emotional for me. Mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, three brothers and three sisters. I was the eldest, and you know, in those days. Uh, farming, it was, it was like a struggle. So my uh, younger brother, my dad decided one of us has to sort of pull out from school. So my youngest, uh, younger brother got pulled out from school and they said, let's educate our eldest son. So, you know, uh, that thing is uh, very emotional for me. It would be too. I mean, what struggle, you, you know, night time, my dad would to take the benzen light, you know, catch the fish and then go and sell and give the fare to me was, you know, something it's very dear to me. I can see the emotion uh, uh, coming through, and that would be emotional, and what a sacrifice. Let me now explore your working life. Uh, um, so you were a librarian, and then, as I said in my introduction, and as you've uh, confirmed, you worked as a public and political affairs specialist at the U.S. Embassy for 16 years. So in essence, briefly, what did that work entail? I started working as a librarian, and I think I was lucky to work under one of the finest uh, journalists in this country, Dennis Rounds. We both started to work at the same time at the embassy. It so happened uh, that uh, after a while, uh, Dennis Rounds uh, departed the embassy and went to work for uh, Australian embassy. So I was I was very vocal about issues, and you know, while I was the librarian, yet you know, we used to meet with uh, uh, team meetings and all those things. I was very vocal. So when Dennis left, I was made the and at that time the United States Information Agency had closed its office in Fiji, so we were basically made redundant. But at the same time, the U.S. ambassador was appointed to Fiji, Don Gavets, and there was no public affairs of so whatsoever. So. I was, we were all made and then uh, Dennis uh, started work at uh, the Australian embassy. And within three days, I was called back to work. After mm -hmm. I made and three days later, I came back to work and started working with Ambassador Don Gavez and I, Gavez, and I was appointed as the public affairs specialist and uh, became the embassy spokesman. And then later on, uh, more responsibilities came in and I took over political and uh, commercial and investment portfolio as well. Okay. Now, what was the most challenging part of your work as a, a public and political affairs specialist? Uh, you know, I have seen two coups, 2000 and 2006. Plus, you know, I think it was a, it's a privilege for me to work for five U.S. ambassadors, three of which were political appointees. And uh, it was a culture that uh, the, uh, even uh, David Lyon, who was uh, sort of the fourth ambassador I worked for, who was a uh, career ambassador, but was more so acting like a political appointee. So it was like a privilege working for directly with the ambassadors, traveling with them in their official cars, you know, and uh, me attending meetings. The ambassadors would consult with me on very sensitive positions. So those uh, moments, and it was like, you know, especially political appointees, they were, you know, very high profile people. So, you know, working with them was like doing MBA, was doing like political, you know, negotiations and all those lending from there was an immense uh, 
uh, asset to me. So yes, those were the highlights, you know, and uh, I, be- I rose to become of the most senior local employees of the American embassy in Suva. Okay. And uh, in your 16 years of uh, experience at the U.S. embassy in Suva, what was your most satisfying moment? Uh, my most satisfying moment was um, Shashi, you know, uh, during the Iraq war uh, in the Middle East, uh, you know, uh, a Fijian soldier, soldier was uh, sort of uh, killed and uh, there was a change of, uh, uh, you know, mistaken, uh, mistakenly bodies were changed and the wrong body arrived in uh, Fiji. So we worked day and night trying to console the family here who had received the, you know, wrong person, uh, wrong corpse. So we had to do a lot of work. Uh, we had, had to go in overdrive and, you know, had that uh, body sent back and then get the right body over here. So that, uh, you know, and uh, that allowed us to sort of interact with the um, family of the deceased. It, it took us a lot of time to sort of manage the situation. And I was in the forefront with the defense attache. Uh, trying to sort of, uh, uh, you know, do damage control, make sure the family is taken care of. And so I think those, those, and, you know, and also another incident that sort of was a highlight of my embassy, uh, embassy experience was uh, repatriation of remains of a soldier killed in War II from uh, Navudini Hills. And uh, during those days, uh, during the repatri- repatriation process, you know, I worked with the Fiji military forces very closely, spent time with them there. We came there. And eventually we got the remains out and had it uh, delivered to their family for the final burial thing. So those were the highlights. And the U.S. Embassy was never a boring place for me to walk in. I can well imagine so. What would you say was the most disappointing experience in the 16 uh, years of service in the diplomatic corps? Uh, the, my most uh, disappointing and really very painful uh, after serving the U.S. Embassy for 17 years, the most painful was the, de- the way I departed from the embassy. You know, I was the most uh, awarded uh, uh, local employee. I worked with the U.S. ambassadors. But then, you know, during the 2006, uh, leading up to the 2006 coup, we had some serious differences. Uh, you know, you know Shashi, let me explain you here. I'm a local employee. I handle political affairs. Uh, previous ambassadors, I am... I'm, I'm required to speak my mind out. I cannot become an S-man of the ambassador. I have to give the ambassador the real situation on the ground, what mm-hmm. is happening, you know, and if, if I was going after my salary, I would have keep, kept my mouth shut and, you know, become an S-man. But I had, from a year or so, I had a feeling that I'm not going to last in the, this position or in this, institu- in this embassy for long, but I stood my ground. I, I was very forthright with the ambassador. We had some very serious differences uh, on uh, the uh, uh, things leading up to the 2006 coup. Uh, some of that uh, involved uh, the commander at that time, the current prime minister. So we had our differences. And I think, uh, you know, another of the issues was the congressional delegation. You know, recently, you know, Pelosi went to Taiwan, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, everybody was saying why Pelosi went to Taiwan you know, uh, against the advice of the State Department. You know, uh, executive branch and the legislative branch are quite different. They're quite independent. You know, State Department can advise but cannot stop a congressional uh, member to travel. So, you know, the congressional uh, delegation that was coming to Fiji after the 2006 coup uh, wanted to consult with me. Uh, My opinion was that, uh, you know, they should engage rather than isolate. Uh, my reason being that, you know, if you isolate, there is going to be a Chinese at the door still waiting to fill them. Mm-hmm. All right. We... Thank you. Talk about my departure from the U.S. Embassy was that, you know, there are things very sensitive. You know, the embassy shared the information with me. I did a lot of sensitive work. And just because I departed the embassy, that doesn't mean that I can I am going to betray their trust and betray my standing in the American community. I still enjoy a very good relationship with American investors and American business people, embassy as well. So I leave it uh, to that, uh, Shashi. So you left the embassy. Were you actually asked to leave or you then finally uh, well, left you know, voluntarily? I was, I was uh, questioned on certain issues and mm-hmm. uh, in Washington. And, uh, you know, uh, the great thing was, uh, Shashi, while I was in Washington, I had an ambassador there, former ambassador, and about five former foreign service officers who we engaged, who came to know about it, 
took me to dinner, was sending by me. You know, while we, I had one American officer here who had put me through this, but I had about seven American officers in Washington, D.C. standing by my side. And one of the deputy ambassador, or now he's currently an ambassador in some country, he advised me, Nirmal, don't go through this. You know, how you are going to go back and work for an embassy that has treated you like this? So uh, I, came, I uh, next day I said, no, I'm not going to go through this. The goodwill that uh, I had with the embassy staff currently in the appointment uh, uh, has has been destroyed. And I don't think I can go and walk and back in that place. I came back and did not receive a termination letter, nor did I resign. I departed because I think, you know, uh, I, I on one aspect, I agree uh, with uh, the U.S. embassy is that even on, on my position, being a senior officer of the embassy, I cannot be there, there cannot be seen to be a perception of myself siding with any particular group. Uh, needless to say that, you know, I am a Fiji citizen. My loyalty lies to Fiji, my country of birth. Uh, however, you know, let me tell that Americans never asked me to sort of compromise my loyalty to my country. So under those circumstances, it was uh, I left. All right. Point taken. Now, what is it that you do these days? I've seen on your Facebook posts uh, where you travel to some Pacific countries like PNG on business. And then again, uh, another post, I see you on your farm in Nandranga. So yeah, what, does you know, Singh, what does Nirmal Singh Chima do these days? Uh, after leaving the embassy, you know, for, uh, uh, Shashi, within three days, on, I was on my feet again. Uh, there were a number of offers made to me for employment. And then I decided that why, you know, why should I go and work for somebody else? So I spoke to one of those with Fiji Water, Vodafone. Uh, they all started offering me employment. So I spoke to them, you know, this is the time I want to establish my own company. And you know, do my own own work, and if the same working contract out to me. So eventually, I was able to establish my management consultants, Fiji Limited, Shashi. And uh, today, I am uh, uh, invest mostly. I deal with American investors. I am a uh, partner for a Singaporean government-owned company here. So I do a lot of investment work. You know, uh, if I can say one thing with your permission, you know, when it comes to our country and politics, government, uh, we should look both of them distinctly, distinctively apart. You know, we might might hate our government. We might not support them. We want to get rid of them. That's not one issue. But we should never harm our country in any way. You know, so I, I, I try to help my country uh, bring in investments, create more jobs and uh, do my part as a citizen of this country to help my country move forward. Well said. Uh, let me now discuss your early political aspirations. Mm -hmm. Firstly, which was the first political party that you got affiliated with? Uh, I, I actually uh, didn't get, uh, after leaving the embassy, I did not get affiliated to any particular political party. It happened one day, you know, uh, there was a vacuum and I, you know, I was, you know, very active in secrets, you know, cockery secrets and all those stuff, attending other uh, functions. So, you know, the thing started that we should start a new political party. Uh, so I came uh, to the, uh, my office was by in FTC. Felix Anthony was very close to me. And I think Krishna was, that was working on the other side, tried to form his own party. So myself and Felix, we initially spoke about it. And then we brought Krishna that in. And then we are the founders of the People's Democratic Party. So that was my first, first link with the political uh, party in the country. Uh, I'm one of the founders. And later okay. on, we had others who joined in. All right, I'll come to the People's Democratic Party in a moment. Sure, sure. What I'd like to know right now is what was the driving force for interest in politics for you, for your interest? I think it runs in our blood, you know, and uh, I was a JC's member. You know, if you look at the people who are past JC members, you would find that, you know, say Vijayar Singh, you know, we have Kanti Tapu, Hari Punja. There are, there are all successful uh, people. My uh, I, While I was not very successful in the business, I, I, I was very vocal and I thought I, there was a vacuum in the political arena and I jumped into it. No regrets. All right. So you said you met Felix Anthony, then Mr. Krishna Dutt. And you yeah. guys discussed the formation of a new political party. Uh, yeah. So what was the reason for forming that new political party? You know, there was a vacuum. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other political parties had gone quite silent. And we could see in the younger generation, there was an edge for a new political movement. We could feel it. And you would note once the uh, People's Democratic Party was formed, it thrived. 
you know, I, I was the spokesman. I became the face of the party and it really uh, thrived within a very short period of time. And that was indicative that there were people supportive of that party, the supportive of that movement. And uh, we had built into a very formidable, formidable uh, political force in a very short time. Okay, now in 2014, there were allegations that you were sacked from the PDP on 20th January of that year, 2014. Is that uh, is there any truth in that statement? Uh, and, see, and, and, you know, and let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. Is there any truth in that statement? And what led to that split? Okay. Uh, uh, there is uh, no truth in the fact that I was sacked. Whoever is passing that information is suffering from delusional disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what happened, uh, Shashi, was, uh, you know, the uh, there were laws, electoral laws, made that forbid uh, trade union officials from participating into politics. And uh, both Daniel Rai and uh, Felix Anthony would say things at a time in a public forum that was constituted as political participation, political process. So I was on an interview in, uh, so Vijay Narayan from uh, Fiji Villas interviewed me and asked about the involvement of Felix and Daniel Urai. And I said, you know, no, uh, People's Democratic Party uh, belongs to the people of Fiji. It doesn't belong to Felix and Daniel Urai or Fiji Trades Union Congress. So, you know, my my idea was not to discredit Felix Anthony or, or Daniel Rai. I personally feel they are not public officers. They should be in politics. They should be allowed to participate in the political process. They can, they, uh, there is nobody better to represent the interests of workers than Felix himself. But that was the law at that time. And I was very fearful that the party might get suspended. So I tried to defend the party. But next day, there was a meeting called by the trade union movement. And basically, you know, they, they were not very happy about that statement. I explained why. So the, the party decided, the FTUC arm of the party decided that, you know, they, I, I should be neutralized. Neutralized in the fact that I should not speak to the media anymore or take any active part in the party other than being a member. I found that untenable. You know, I'm a fighter. I'm a frontline fighter. You know, I'll not go back and sit in the corner. And then, you know, I thought there were some moves to, you know, there were some contradicting statements coming out. And, you know, and I thought it was best for me to leave. So I resigned. Uh, Sashi, you can see the press release that I issued. I think, you know, the, the People's Democratic Party was more important. It was uh, indispensable. I am uh, dispensable. A lot of people had lot of, put a lot of work into the party. So I decided to resign. And that's what I did. I think today both myself and Felix would be agreeing, you know, would be regretting and agreeing that, you know, we could have handled it better and People's Democratic Party uh, would be still around. But that was not to happen. It's uh, out under the bridge. We have moved on. You know, Democratic Party, People's Democratic Party is not there anymore. And I am not with Fiji Fest. So that's history. All right. Uh, I understand you then joined Sodelpa sometime after. Now, did you join Sodelpa for the 2014 election or did you join them for the 2018 election? I, I joined them in 2014. You know, when I left PDP, I wanted to form another party. My supporters uh, from Lombasa and some Western Division uh, sort of were encouraging me to form another party. And, you know, I, I thought it was a bad idea to form another political party. So, I you know, I kept neutral for a while. And then I, approached, I was approached by some people from Nandronga, Pio Tambaywalu, and uh, even my paramount chief. So, you know, and uh, the, the chief from my Nandronga, my paramount chief from Nandronga. So, you know, I decided to join Soralpa and, uh, you know, contest the 2014 election. If I may ask you, what was the attraction there? Why did you choose to join Sodelpa? You know, after I left uh, People's Democratic Party, you know, I was uh, invited by Mr. Prasad, uh, Biman and uh, Choudhury to come on board. But here is the thing, uh, uh, Sashi. My driving force to join the Sodalpa was for, for more than 100 fear, and more than 100 years. We both Indians and Fijians have been in our own corner and playing rugby scrums. We have been, you know, locking horns for more than 100 years. Uh, and my justification was our population is going down. You know, uh, people are migrating, uh, and our population will continue to go go down. Uh, and it is what is important to build bridges. 
between both the races, you know, instead of playing rugby scrum, let's, you know, get together and play football and pass balls, you know. So the idea was to get both the races and I acted as a bridge, you know, I, I, I was not successful. Uh, you know, the, the, even today, it, it will be all about racial voting. And, uh, you know, that was that's what 1997 constitution gave us so that we can share power on based on racial lines. Uh, so, you know, I, I tried uh, for them, for my community, uh, got rejected because I was not, uh, I got rejected from the uh, indigenous people of the party because I was not one of them. I rejected my own community because I went and stood on the other side. But no regrets. You know, I still have the respect of the people I walk towards. But one day, one day, uh, Sashi will have no alternative but to work with our indigenous people and uh, help build our country and assist our people that will remain here. Now, the Sodelpa Party is well known for its stand on some hardline policies. How did you sit with the hardline policies, for example, the Ngolingoli Bill? Uh, I think there were a lot of uh, misconceptions, you know, uh, the politics of the day at the time, uh, twisted things. If you, and I must say, as far as, uh, you know, in Sodelpa Party, uh, my, uh, my, ability to say things, you know, I hold, had all the freedom. I think I had uh, more freedom to say things than most of the indigenous members of the Sodalpa because I think some people were hesitant to speak up or stand up and speak because Rote Mumukepa, the Tui Raketi, the uh, Rokotri Raketi was the leader of the party. But, you know, I had a very good relation, working relationship with her. You know, I could raise issues. Coming to the Golingoli bill, I think it was misconstrued. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, our Indian community thought that I won't be able to go and, uh, to the sea and catch fish or sea, uh, you know, sea resources to survive. I think the Golingoli was meal, uh, meant for commercial utilization of the sea resources. That is still happening today. The government is collecting the Golingoli, you know, they are collecting the fees uh, and passing on to the land owners or the sea, the, the Matangali that owns the Golingoli. So Golingoli hasn't gone away. It's still around. The government is collecting. I think the same idea was uh, espoused by Sodelpa. But, you know, politics of the day and our approach, I think our whole uh, our public relations approach regarding this thing was wrong. So, you know, I, I, I thought uh, today, if you see the Golingoli bill, it might be not the writing, but still the government is collecting levies, royalties, and then I think passing on to the land owners. All right. And uh, amongst the Ngolingoli bill, were other issues brought by the Sodelpa party? As uh, an Indian member of Sodelpa, how did, how did it sit with you? Were you still comfortable with them? Well, you know, I, I, I think the thing, good thing was I was not sidelined. I was very vocal on issues. You know, uh, they were fighting for their rights. We were fighting for our rights. Nothing has changed today. We are still called Vulangis today. Uh, we still are being, uh, you know, uh, marked for celebrating uh, Diwali's on Sundays. So nothing has changed. But I think, you know, Rotemu Mukepa uh, was a leader who had the vision, you know, she did a lot of work with Girmitias in uh, uh, Rewa, you know, she, she, uh, she treats all the descendants of, uh, you know, Girmitias as Rewans, you know, so that, that, that if that lady would have been given a chance, I think we, we would have seen a different Fiji. It, well, it, I just it, want to... Yep. Go on. It, it is just natural uh, that different. Uh, we, you know, we are Indians. Uh, we are. I am fourth generation here. I've got a granddaughter now. Uh, we are fighting for our rights. Uh, Fijian people are only five hundred thousand in this world. This is their identity. This is their vanua. Uh, what we should be doing is uh, building up a common ground where both our races uh, live in harmony with each other. We need each other. For hundred years, uh, you know, we have lived together, and I don't think we can live without uh, each other. Uh, any time in future. I just got to add, uh, you said that we are all, uh, we are still Vulangis. Uh, in terms of the Fiji First Government, they have always stated that uh, Fiji, uh, every citizen of Fiji, they're all Fijians, and uh, that no one is a Vulangi. I know of recent statements made in the last few days by a provisional candidate, but let's leave that there. I don't want to start uh, a, a, an argument on... Yeah. Uh, on, on trying to typecast a particular race or, or uh, citizens of Fiji. How long did you remain with Sodelpa and what were the circumstances that uh, led you to leave or resign from Sodelpa? 
I think you know the. Uh, I think it was last year during the just before the AGM, you know, where Rambuka was going. To, it was last year or before last. I think before last year, and uh, I did. I mean, after the election on twenty fourteen, I did not play a very prominent role or very visible role in the party. But then I, you know, the country was going through a lot of uh, challenges, and here we had infighting among Soralpa, fighting among leadership. A uh, lot of energy was uh, being, you know, spent on uh, infighting within the party. Uh, you can see what has happened today. And I thought, you know, I do not want to be a party, just even by being a member of a party, to be a, a party to such a development when our country needs uh, unity, when our country needs uh, clear leadership. And then we have here a party uh, that Fijian people or even, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the country uh, feels could be an alternative government. And we have a party that is fighting among themselves. So I, I thought, you know, this, this is nonsense. You know, I'm not going to be part of this uh, nonsense. So I resigned. Okay. Then after Sodelpa, where to politically? Did you join any other party? After Sadalpa, I did not join any other party. I have been in touch with, you know, I, uh, I, I speak to Biman uh, all the time. I was very close to, uh, you know, even People Alliance Party. Um, I'm a very close friend of Manwa, Manwa Kamikamida, Kenny. Uh, but, you know, the, the uh, development within the party uh, sort of said, you know, okay, Nirmal, you might, might as well back out and, uh, you know, continue writing your feelings and, you know, what you think of the country as an independent. So that's what I did. You know, I haven't joined any particular particular political party uh, at the moment. I am not a member of any political party, nor I have applied to be a candidate in the next election with any political party. I've shown my interest. I have spoken to members. Uh, I have uh, spoken to leaders of the party. Uh, but as yet, you know, I I, 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 that, that I want to be, you know, Sashi, let me put it in one sentence. I want to be part of unity, not a part of division. Thank you. All right. Well stated. Uh We'll discuss uh, the prospects of unity a little later in the program sure. because I have certain questions that I want to ask you uh, mm -hmm. pertaining to some recent posts that you've posted. So I'll, I'll question you on the concepts of uh, a, a united uh, front, I guess, and we'll come sure. to that shortly. You mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the People's Alliance, and I guess it's a good point at this stage uh, to raise with you because out of that division within Sodelpa, uh, was the birth of the People's Alliance Party. Now, how do you perceive the People's Alliance in the current political landscape in Fiji? I, I think uh, um, uh, Rambuka started very well. You know, he had the logistics, he had the network, uh, uh, he had the support of uh, <coughs> uh, some uh, media personalities. So uh, overall, I think he started very well. And, you know, frankly, you know, if you really look at it, uh, then he sort of started, uh, we, we thought, you know, he's going to create a new political order, new political culture, new political party. We'll have, uh, you know, fresh people coming in. But then, you know, marches in a loose cannon, you know, and from Sodalpa, you know, and you start thinking, you know, whether this is another Sol Sodalpa being created here. You, uh, we'll have to wait for a couple of weeks or a, a month or so to see who else comes into the party. But, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes is very skeptical about, uh, you know, when you start bringing in uh, uh, people from the party that you have left and uh, it creates a sort of, uh, you know, whether you're competing with each other, or you're trying to create a new political, uh, you know, culture. All right. Now, you've told us uh, that you have politics running in your blood, that you were one of the founding members of the People's Democratic Party. You then joined Sodelpa. You've just made a statement that uh, you'd like to enter the political fray only if there was unity uh, around the political game. Is there any motivating factor for you right now that appeals to you to make a political stand? Uh, Shashi, look, <clears throat> let me say this. Uh, Fiji needs Mahendra Chaudhary. If anybody can revive the sugar industry, and I, th I, th I think it's him. Fiji needs Biman Prasad. Fiji needs Nasavenada Narumbe. You know, these are veterans. You know, a lot of people wrote on my post that, you know, that these old, uh, you know, I mean, that they, it was not a very uh, polite, uh, diplomatic language to use by our, our writers. But, you know, 
the country is in such a situation at the moment, we need veterans, you know. And uh, when I see individually, I see Narumbe, I see uh, Gavoka, who has a very strong background in the tourism. I see Mahen, who is such as, you know, a trade union guy, a farmer's uh, champion. Then I see Biman, a wonderful economist. I see Lenora, you know, I see Andy Siviangoro, who is the past... Uh, uh, government minister, uh, uh, senior civil civil servant, uh, consultant to the UN. So we have high-profile people individually. Mm-hmm. But collectively, tell me, Sashi, which particular political party today can say I have a fully established cabinet here? This is my mm-hmm. cabinet. None. You know, we are joking about Fiji Fest, Silent 25. That thing will apply. But just imagine if this group comes together for the sake of the country, for the sake of the people, for the interests of these people, of our people. Just imagine what a formidable force it will be. And it, it will be truly a government of national unity. It, it is just a step away. Uh, we need to have goodwill among our leaders. We need our leaders to put their egos aside and think of the country. If we don't, can I add here or do you want to proceed with other questions before we? I'll ask you to stop. Okay, fine. On this Thank one, you. because I'm going sure. to come to this unity, sure. and I'm yes, dying to right. ask you a number of things on the on, on the unity subject. So please fine. hold fire for a little while. Sure. sure. Uh, Let me know if I go too fast, Sashi, or I'm going out of the... You know, just, just uh, you know, stop me anytime you wish to. No, no, you're doing well. Let me now discuss the merger of parties, because uh, uh, this is the first time that uh, we see parties planning to have a coalition post-election, because obviously they can't do it uh, during election. So firstly, what are your views on the National Federation Party merger with the People's Alliance? What do you think of that merger? uh, When when I talk about merger, what does uh, uh, post-election memorandum of understanding do? I don't think it it serves any purpose. If uh, if, uh, a People's Alliance gets 13 seats, and uh, the Fiji uh, NFP gets uh, five seats, still they are not able to be able to form the government. You'll need somebody from the outside. So uh, I, I don't see the purpose behind this memorandum of understanding. Anything we needed was pre-election. Mm. And this is, I think, you know, the, uh, the, the more longer the ele- election is, uh, you know, sort of postponed, or, you know, we don't know the date. But we, we have an opportunity to come to some understanding you know, uh, political leaders, you know, I, I compared to them, Shashi, I'm very young politically. But we know we have very mature political leaders. They have gone through this in 2014. They have gone through this, 20, through this in 2018. Aren't they learning? Aren't, aren't they aware of the psyche of our voters? You know, you go, you, uh, uh, frankly, you know, when um, uh, Unity Party has a meeting, for example, in Korovuto, you know, you have 100 people here. Somehow they think that that 100 people is their vote. But they fail to realize that same 100 people are attending the NFP meeting. They are attending the Fiji Labour Party meeting. So, you know, whom they have only one vote. You know, I, I mean, this time people should be very conscious of the challenges we are going on, our leaders. And then they, they should put their differences aside and say the post-election uh, uh, memorandum of understanding doesn't hold any significance. It's pre-election that we should focus on. And I think it is within our reach. It is the goodwill of our leaders. It is the resolve of our leaders. And it is, it is the, you know, we need them to look beyond. We, we need them to look what our country is going through. You know, and they can't take chances. And, you know, uh, let me say here, uh, Sashi, if, because, you know, since 2006, a new political order has been created in this country. You know, a new culture has been created. So those people who were uh, in uh, uh, seven years old, eight years old, are now on the voting age. And this is all they have seen. And if our political party leaders don't get together and, you know, uh, give them a better option, people will accept this is the norm. This is the normal Fiji. So this election is very critical to take the ownership of our country. And the only way we can, only way we can do is our, if our leaders unite uh, before the elections. You talk of leaders. What are your views on the two respective leaders, uh, Mr. Sithi Veni Rambuka and Professor Biman Prasad? 
I think uh, both, I have a lot of respect for both of them. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, Mr. Rambuka, I had a very close relationship with him while I was working for the U.S. Embassy uh, uh, during the ambassadorship of Don Gavetz. Uh, and, you know, uh, the embassy hasn't taken any credit. The ambassador hasn't take it, taken any credit. Uh, but uh, the only thing I would to add, uh, the ambassador Don Gavetz played a significant role in getting uh, Rambuka and Mr. Jairam ready together. So I have a lot of respect for Mr. Rambuka. You know, uh, he gave us the 1997 constitution, which was sort of one of the best constitutions we had. It was power sharing. It was the reality of a reflection of the reality on the ground that both we are different. We are relig uh, we have different religion, different culture. We are both different, so you know uh, the, the allocation of seats was based on race, but it it, it gave an opportunity for us to uh, do have power sharing, and you know uh, the guy lost under that constitution, the very constitution he gave us, he lost the election in 1999, and he sort of humbled out, he, you know he got out of uh, you know he didn't create any trouble, you know he said okay, you know that's that's the constitution he gave, and that was the result of it. But, you know, uh, coming down later on, he has, he has, I'm not going to mention, but he has a lot of questions to answer. And uh, I think as a leader, he should clear a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, issues that he needs to address. You know, a prime minister, if he gets appointed to the prime minister, it is very important. He has good uh, relationship uh, and trust within the institutions of the state. Uh, yeah, the prime minister has, should have, uh, you know, the confidence of uh, the institutions of the state. Uh, I wish, you know, he he will be able to sort of uh, establish those relations. But uh, again, you know, it all comes to, it's too early to say, you know, we, the, some of the statements that's coming out from his uh, uh, provisional candidate is uh, very painful. He's on a very sensitive position because of history, his history in 87. And people are very jittery, you know. He got punished in 1999. And if he is not uh, very careful, if he is not in control, if he keeps going globe trotting and leaves his people here, uh, making comments like, you know, uh, Bulangis and, you know, why should we celebrate? The Indians should be careful not to uh, celebrate Diwali or use crackers on a Diwali day. Uh, these type of people are hanging around him and he has to ensure that you know he doesn't betray the trust of the indians who have jumped on the bandwagon with him you know so i that, that's where i'll leave it there uh, sashi you, you did you did mention and i'll come back to professor biman prasad in a moment you haven't addressed that but you mentioned that uh, mr siti veni rambuka has a lot of questions to answer would you like to share a few of those questions uh, such as uh, Shashi, uh, because of the sensitivity of it, and uh, he knows what I'm talking about. There are people probably who know, but uh, because the sensitivity of the uh, issue, I leave it there. But, you know, as I said, uh, prime minister, any prime minister who takes a position must have the confidence of the institutions of the state. I'll, I'll leave it there, Sashi. All right. Now, uh, I also asked you uh, your views on Professor Biman Prasad. Uh Biman, I, I think, you know, uh, I must give it to the guy, you know, he single-handedly, you know, he himself has taken a lot of uh, shots in the parliament, a uh, lot of booze, you know, he was the focus, you know, I think the, the entire Fiji face focus was on him, but the guy sort of remained calm. Uh, he sort of reached out to the people. He remained on facts. Uh, and, 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 you know, on those, uh, given those uh, circumstances that he was put in, he excelled and, you know, he was directly able to connect to the people. He wasn't speaking to the speaker at times or speaking to the other side of the aisle, but he was speaking directly to the Fijian people. Okay. Yeah. Now, Nirmal, what are your views on the Unity Fiji Party and Sodelpa Post-Election Alliance? How, if, how effective an alliance would that combination make? You know, sometimes, you know, when I think of uh, this unity thing, you know, I start thinking of Dove, Dove and Sodalpa and Dove and Flower factions, you know. Uh, I, my response is the same that I have for uh, the post-election uh, remember of understanding with uh, NFP and uh, 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 People's Alliance. Same thing, you know, with the uh, Unity Party and Sodalpa. Why post? Why can't you, you know? The thing is, uh, Shashi, we must understand the division within the opposition 
creates division within the people. You know, pe people get divided on those lines. You know, some people support unity, some sort of pass, some pay. Why are we causing division? Such a small, you know, like Indian population is about 30%, 38% of the voting population, you know, and about 50 to 60% will still go to Fiji Fest. And we have here major parties fighting for about, you know, 40% of the Indian votes. Uh, that is risky. That is very risky. You know, why? Even in, in the, the Fijian side of it, uh, uh, the Sodalpa and the Unity Party. I think you know it, it is something that you know Mr. Narumbe is a great guy. The country needs him. He has the credentials. We have Andi Sivi and Goro, you know, who has an excellent credential to uh, you know uh, help uh, uh, bail this country out. But on the own, I'm afraid to say no chance. All right. Well, I'd love to discuss uh, coalition arrangements with other political parties. I shall come back to that in a little while from now. We will discuss your concepts of unity. At this juncture, I would like to steer our discussions towards foreign relations. You have stated that uh, Fiji has failed to continue to be a leader in the Pacific and has destroyed the Pacific way and regional solidarity. Before we actually explore other matters of foreign policy, Nirmal, what did you mean by this statement? Well, you know, uh, are you surprised with uh, my views? You know that you know my the question. You know the thing is, uh, Shashi, uh, the government has been playing flip flop politics. You know, first uh, after the two thousand six uh, coup, we formed a competitive organization because Forum Secretariat wasn't very happy with the political diplomacy. Yeah? And we said, okay, bugger off. We are going to form a competitive organization. And we formed the Pacific Island Development Program. That was the right in competition with uh, the Forum Secretariat. And I think it was a bad move. It was to split the unity among the um, Forum Island countries, uh, our region. And then, you know, uh, later on, if you go through all the, you know, statements by the government, it was very unfortunate. And then, you know, I think USP Saga is part of our foreign policy because it's owned by the region. Mm -hmm. Besides uh, so many investigations uh, clearing uh, uh, both USP and uh, Professor, uh, the president of the USP, Paul Aluwalia, we con still continue to insist that we want an investigation. We are undermining the decision of our other Pacific Island colleagues who are on the USP Council. Why can't we accept that this is the decision or collective decision, majority of the uh, decision of the uh, USP board uh, council, which are comprised of the Pacific Island countries who are on USP, and then pay our dues. So the, these things have really split the Pacific Island countries, and the repercussions will go beyond, which we will discuss later on, uh, Shashi. Okay. Now, can you explain the current foreign policies of this government and if it serves the national interest? Well, I, I don't think it serves our national interest when you start playing flip-flop politics or foreign uh, policy politics. You know, uh, sometimes we are seen to be with China. Sometimes we are uh, uh, allying ourselves to Australia, New Zealand, United States. Uh, we, we sometimes, uh, you know, focus uh, so much on the environment. Sometimes I wonder it's all about money. But, uh, you know, coming back to it, we should be a member of member of a family of democratic nations you know if we really and, and mostly in the pacific island countries the brits are there the european union is there but i think the major you know our alliance should be major uh, we should be with australia new zealand and united states because they are pacific island pacific countries and uh, you know uh, uh, we we share a lot of things in common uh, they have been there in our good times and bad times so we should be very consistent with our foreign policy which we not have been we have been jumping here and there uh, uh, trying to promote our interests. China can be a great country, but that that, that country, uh, you know, politics-wise is, uh, is is nothing, you know, it, I, I don't think we should have any affiliation when it comes to politics with political at a political level. Uh, trade, yes, you know, of course, trade, you know, China is a very important trade partner. Uh, we are a hell of a money to them, you know, so that is a, another issue that we have. But, you know, end of the day, our foreign policy, you know, uh, Sashi, let me say, our foreign policy and defense response policy should complement each other. You know, we are a, a maritime country, you know, there are challenges and there are issues. So our foreign policy should be, you know, Australia, New uh, we sort of uh, be, you know, aligned to Australia, New Zealand, and United States. 
regardless to say that uh, Britain, Canada, India, um, France, they are equally important to us. But you know, this is this is the family of the nation we should be grouping ourselves with. And why is China a problem, according to you? What happened to uh, Sri Lanka? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's a it's a dictatorship. And uh, if we try to align ourselves politically with them, I, I think, you know, uh, the, that type of culture can have some influence on us, us you know, as a small Pacific Island countries. Uh, they normally, you know, they have been giving us, uh, you know, their burden with that. And, you know, they, they have the ability and, you know, in times of uh, challenging times, if we want to be more independent or sort of uh, be, uh, you know, uh, make our own decisions, they, they, they have the ability to pull strings. So I think, you know, and I, I think, you know, the Australian, New Zealand, United States will never try to sort of take advantage of us. But, uh, you know, with Chinese, I will be very skeptical on a political level. Sure. Now, what role has Fiji in the last 60, uh, what role has the, uh, Fiji first played in the last 16 years under that government in terms of regional policy initiatives? I, I really don't know if Fiji first really played any role in the regional policy besides, uh, you know, talking about environment. But the split uh, that Pacific Islands uh, countries are facing because of Fiji, some of the Fiji's behavior is, is quite saddening, you know. And I, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, at one time... Uh, Pacific Island countries where a family was a blob. You know, they collectively decided to handle things. Uh, it's not happening anymore. And I think Fiji had a big role to play to bring about that split among uh, the Pacific Island countries. All right, let me ask you to take a look at the Pacific way and regional solidarity and see what the reality uh, is, is today. However, before I ask you for your comments, I would like to share with our viewers, uh, particularly our younger viewers, that uh, in the early days of the forum, the informal meeting style allowed leaders to better read each other's priorities and develop a rapport amongst each other. And in those days, and I'm talking a few decades ago, led by very strong, strong personal relationship amongst leaders, including Fata Fehi, Tui Pelehaki, Ratu Mara, Albert Henry, Mata Afa, uh, Ayosefo, Hamad de Ribot, and uh, Sir Michael Somare. Conventions were integral and respected in those days. Meetings regularly on informal discussions. Leaders from across the vast Pacific island, island region, uh, they developed enduring friendships, you'll agree. And this enabled those leaders to meet and personally resolve issues when and where they arose in a spirit of consensus building and collaboration. Now, you mentioned the Pacific Way. In his memoir, The Pacific Way, Ratu Sirkamisese Mara, a founding father of the for for a forum, fondly recalls how leaders got together and built those strong relationships, personal relationships, that honored unwritten conventions with gentlemen's agreements. These strong relationships could be called upon in times of disquiet to resolve issues at the forum. This was the Pacific way. Now, in light of that backdrop that I've just painted for you, Nirmal, what has happened to the Pacific way and regional solidarity that once existed? I think you've partially answered that. Yeah, I know, Shashi, I know, Shashi, that was Ratumara. Yeah. That was Ratumara. You know, he, I had the privilege of working with him in the early, uh, my career at the U.S. Embassy. The guy had, and you know, when, like in India, when you talk about Indira Gandhi, you know, the image he had, you know, when you look at Ratu Mara, he was not only a Fijian leader, not only a regional leader, but a global leader as well. Coming to the regional level, you know, he had a lot of respect. He, you know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, the forum have gone into retreat. They are in retreat on this particular island. They're having fun, you know. But that's where most decisions were made. Informal gathering, uh, Ratu Mara had that aroma of, uh, aroma of uh, authority, respect among the Pacific Island countries. He engaged, he respected their views. Uh, say Michael Somare played a very significant role as well. 
uh, always complimented Ratu Mara and so other leaders of the Pacific. Uh, the smaller Pacific island countries were dependent upon Fiji to you know, promote their interests as well. It was uh, during Ratu Mara's time, it was never about Fiji. It was about Pacific island. It was a Pacific bloc. Uh, you know, later on, uh, we can uh, you know, discuss uh, you know, how this has impacted us in a global arena. But you know, we, we have, it will take a, a lot of time to bring that Pacific way back. These days we talk about Vuam Vale or something. I have no idea what is that, you know, it doesn't identify with the Pacific Island countries. But Pacific way was something that, you know, people were very proud. The Pacific community was very proud. It sort of uh, uh, trickled down to the grassroots levels at USP, at Fiji School of Medicine, in other countries, you know, uh, forums and all those things. But those those things are not to be seen anymore. And I hope uh, when there is a change of government, one of the first initiatives we do is to take responsibility to what has happened. You know, to take responsibility for the damage we have done and try to re rebuild our uh, in our profile among the Pacific Island countries again. Talking about that regional solidarity and the importance of that uh, in in the Pacific. Do you think the current Fiji First government, whether they've contributed towards that solidarity or have they in fact played a part in dividing that solidarity? I think, I think the, uh, we have basically you know, destroyed the Pacific way. Uh, we, uh, we, we sort of uh, were adamant. We expect the Pacific Island countries to follow us. Uh, what we say is right, you know, there is no consensus building. Uh, the USP saga speaks for itself, you know, that, that I, I seriously consider that what has happened in the uh, uh, USP situation is a failure of our foreign policy. It, it is not a private institution, it's a regional uh, institution uh, owned by foreign government, uh, 12, I think it's 12 uh, Pacific Island government. And that is where the solidarity is reflective of, you know, and our behavior at USP is uh, something that has really damaged our credibility within the Pacific Island countries. Yes, I'll be looking at uh, USP, the saga at USP, and uh, education when we discuss education. Nirmal, still looking at some of the actions taken by the current Fiji First government. The closure of Fiji's diplomatic mission in USA took many by surprise, what do you think was the strategy behind this and what good or what damage has it done? Uh, I, I, I think, you know, it, it was a very, it, it was a lap, lapse of a serious judgment on part of the Fijian government to close the uh, foreign diplomatic mission, our, our diplomatic mission in uh, Washington. Uh, uh, we sent a wrong signal, you know, we kept our diplomatic mission in uh, China and then we closed our diplomatic mission in um, uh, in uh, in Washington DC, uh, you, you recall I had issued a you know press statement. It was well covered that you know it, this this is a very bad move. I even uh, tried to speak to some people in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, trying to convince them as a former employee of the uh, State Department uh, that this is not a very good decision. And I will tell you why uh, this is not a very good decision. Uh, uh, and you know, running your embassy from New York is, is not a viable thing. You know, Washington is a uh, is a structure of its own. You can't cannot operate a diplomatic mission from New York. It's not going to work. It, it's going to work in name, but in, I don't think we'll be able to deliver anything. Uh, uh, in Washington, you know, uh, uh, the, the issue has been that we should have been sending ambassadors or high uh, sorry ambassadors to Washington who had the will, we have, who had the know-how, we, we had the courage and the will to push them through the door to go, go, go reach up to the, the higher hierarchy of the government. Uh, there is a process, you can do that. You know, uh, we have an, a representative, uh, Pacific representative in the Congress, uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, the representative from American Samoa. We could have started building bridges through them. The U.S. Congress is a good way to start. And But, you know, they, they, a lot of uh, high commissioner, high ambassadors went there and uh, the co attending cocktail secret was uh, all it, it sort of entailed. And uh, the closure of the U.S. Embassy was a failure on our part, uh, you know, to recognize the importance of Americans in, uh, in our foreign policy. And I, I think it was an insult in some sense while keeping the uh, embassy in China and then closing the embassy in Washington. Talking about uh, ambassadors, foreign governments send their ambassadors to Fiji for a number of reasons. Uh, 
diplomatic missions are established. In the past, these ambassadors would engage with all political parties, leaders in the community. In recent times, uh, concerns have been expressed amongst some Fijian political leaders that some foreign ambassadors based in Suva do not engage with them. That is the uh, opposition parties. Firstly, uh, firstly, let me finish. Firstly, what would the reason be behind this? And secondly, is it a case of better the devil you know than the devil you don't? Uh, Shashi, before I answer that question, there is a very important thing I want to mention about the close of the diplomatic mission, if you could allow me a minute or so to address that, and then I'll yes, come sure. to your question later. Uh, sure. You know, well, when I spoke about keeping the diplomatic mission in the United States, it was an important uh, factor in the fact that, you know, uh, during the days of Ratu Mara uh, or even later on, uh, we had 12 votes, you know, considering the Pacific Island countries, and we always operated as a bloc. You know, so you know the, the, the Fiji was seen as a leader. So you know, when when it came to United Nations or voting in any other regional organizations or international organizations, we had a bucket of twelve votes because there was a solidarity among Pacific Island countries. We are united. Fiji was the leader. Fiji uh, was in the forefront. You'd recall uh, Ratu Mara even uh, had the opportunity to go and uh, meet and sit down with the President Ronald Reagan. He was praised a lot because we were united. And then, you know, uh, we had, uh, through that uh, initiative, we had the formation of Joint Commercial Commission uh, between the United States and the Pacific Island countries. And every year, a U.S. president would meet Pacific Island countries, uh, country leaders in Hawaii. So it was an important factor, but, you know, that we, we couldn't carry it through. I think we got focused on some other things and we lost that opportunity. So I think United you know, the, the incoming government, whoever it is, I think one of their first priority should be to re-engage, uh, not to re-engage, I think we are engaged with the United States, but I think it's to establish the diplomatic mission in in, United, in Washington, D.C. Now, coming back to your question, you know, let me tell you one thing with my experience in the diplomatic mission for 16 years. Uh, none of the diplomatic foreign diplomatic mission based here are here for the Fijian people or to protect mm -hmm. or promote the interests of Fiji. None. One of their primary role is to look after the interests of the, their citizens of their country in Fiji. Secondly, they promote their own national interest, not Fiji's interest. Not a single diplomatic mission here based is promoting or looking after the interests of Fiji. Yes, they give us money, they give us grant, they give us loan. But in return, they are promoting their own national interest. Now, engaging with uh, uh, the opposition uh, parties. Uh, in, in a normal democracy, you know, during my time in the embassy, you know, I, I, I was free uh, to organize a uh, reception at home just for the Fiji Labour Party members. I think we had some differences in sometimes, you know, Labour Party and US Embassy didn't see eye to eye. So we would get together. Uh, invite them and then, you know, talk to them, you know, that this, and, you know, the permanent secretary and prime minister's office would find out, would give me a call and say, hey, you guys had a function for uh, Fiji Labour Party. And I said, yeah, we have some differences and all those things. And, you know, there was never a time when the previous governments ever questioned any diplomatic mission, why they were engaging with uh, uh, this particular pro political party. Or the... Now the situation is quite challenging. I think first of all, uh, the, the way, the behavior of the Fiji government in dealing with the diplomatic mission has a big role to play. I think, you know, the, the, the as I said, the, the foreign countries based here are promoting their own national interest. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, they don't want to sort of, uh, it, it, it's, it's something, it's, it's a tough in the diplomatic community uh, to lose, the, because they have to deal with the government of the day. They must ensure they have a good relation with the government of the day, because it's the government of day decides, you know, foreign policy, decides the relationship with the country, where to vote, where not to vote, which side to side, which side not to side. So, you know, it was that situation, I think, in under that situation uh, that uh, the foreign missions, you know, are engaging. In fact, your ambassador, freaking fix, I call him freaking fix, really, you know, your ambassador, former ambassador, high commissioner to Fiji, he, he basically uh, openly, you know, I've never seen a, a foreign diplomatic, uh, you know, foreign ambassador to so openly 
uh, you know, uh, uh, stand with the government and then um, uh, snub the opposition. Uh, these things were not seen in my time or ever before, but uh, this, this is new Fiji. This is uh, Fiji where even diplomatic missions, I think, find it difficult to uh, uh, operate the way they wish to operate. And uh, as far as engaging, I think Biman has raised this question uh, of uh, diploma, uh, no, diplomats not engaging with him uh, or not uh, engaging with the opposition parties. Now, the question is, which, par which party to engage with? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we have Unity, we have NFP, we have PEP, we have Fiji Labour Party. Uh, I, I think they get invited to functions. I'm not sure whether they get invited. But I, I think, you know, where diplomatic missions are careful, uh, you know, at the moment, you know, as I said, you know, their interest is to promote their own national interest. They don't give two hoots about Fiji, uh, you know, no matter what happens. You know, previously, you know, I, in, in my days, you know, if there was a violation of Fiji in human rights or in any matter for that matter, you know, United States takes out a Fiji human rights report every year. Uh, we were very vocal. We could criticize, you know, uh, and, you know, the, 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 uh, I know Chochi Kotambalabu at times would ring me and, you know, give me hell and all those things. But that was it, you know, uh, they never sort of went to a stage of, you know, punishing us or telling us, you know, that, uh, or undermining our relationship. And some of these human rights reports were quite negative on the government, uh, especially in the Goli Goli bill, the reconciliation bill. We are quite vocal on those things. Uh, these days, uh, changes, uh, things have changed. The, the, the environment has changed. So I think the diplomatic missions are being careful. They want to deal with the government of the day. And uh, they, they don't want to sort of uh, in any way perceive to be seen to be uh, in some way against the government. That's why they're quite, you know, there's so many things happening. Not a single statement, you know. So I, I think it's a sad state of affairs. I hope we can rectify this when new, governments, uh, new government comes in. Have a little break. Have a drink of water if you'd like to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you know, we you discuss are, about yesterday. The Punjab, you know, we Punjabis speak very loud. You know, and uh, you know uh, this. Uh, uh, the last, I was wondering whether you would be in program this uh, today or not because last night I saw you had so much into songs and music, and but I was trying to scan the place for scotch. I didn't see any, so I thought you might be all right. So I had my bottle of scotch this morning as well. I thought I might as well start it, but I said no, I couldn't see any scotch, so I might as well be somber. You know. <laughs> no, no. Have a drink of water. Uh, the show must go on. And uh, as for last night, we had a prayer day at home. We had a 12-month uh, memorial prayer for a departed uh, family member. And uh, it was a sober night. Uh, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, And our chief guest today is Mr. Nirmal Singh Chima, former public and political affairs specialist with the American Embassy in Suva, former member of Sodelpa, and a past national president of the Fiji JCs. Please like and follow the SSTP page and uh, share this page if you can, so that as many people can watch this program. And I remind you that a full recording of all SSTP episodes from 1 to 31 at the end of today's program can be viewed either on Facebook or on YouTube at a time convenient to you. Nirmal, uh, I've raised the issue of uh, the Fiji military forces with a number of my guests on SSTP, some have expressed their concerns and stated what they believe the military's role should be in Fiji. Now, you have been quite vocal about the role of the military in Fiji. Firstly, let me raise with you, what are your concerns? Um, I, I think the concern is uh, not uh, 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 really towards the military. My concern is because, as I said, I have seen a number of coups. And, uh, you know, the military uh, currently, you know, uh, says that they have the overall responsibility to safeguard the interests of Fiji and its people, well-being of its people. But, you know, all coups, uh, you know, somehow, uh, not somehow, it was directly the result of the military. Even the 2000 coup, we call it civilian coup. It wasn't a civilian coup. If it was civilian coup, then you know how did the arms end up? You know, arms ended up in the in the in, at, at the parliament. So all were military coups. So you know the thing is, we must, as I said in my post, we must reform the military. Military is a reality. Military is here to stay. Uh, you know, frankly, I'm one of those uh, very few civilians who had a very close working relationship. You know, with the military. Um, I have, uh, you know, during my days with, with the embassy, I had very close relationship with my defense attaches. So I had, a, you know, open access at the embassy. We have a military camp. Uh, we had very good uh, relationship. We worked together. We, had, we trained together. We did a lot of uh, outreach, you know, uh, uh, 
a lot of uh, civic assistance, a lot of projects carried out for the people. So I, I'm sort of one of those bit lucky to be, have that very close uh, links with the military. But, you know, like any other institution, we must reform the military. And it, 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 the, it, all successive governments have been uh, somewhat... Uh, hesitant to touch the military, you know. And I think, you know, the uh, leader who uh, there should be a prime minister who has the confidence of the military, who has the ability to go and sit down with them and see this is not the path we should go. I feel, I personally feel, as I mentioned in my Facebook, that, uh, you know, we, we are a maritime country. We are a maritime country. Uh, I, I just wonder why we should have such a large land force. You know, uh, if I have my way, I would reduce the how uh, the assets and the personal personnel of the armed force, land force by half, retrain them, and then engage them into uh, maritime surveillance. And you know, because frankly, you know, a lot of people will ask where the money is coming from. You know, all the human human trafficking, the drug smuggling. You know, all this thing is not destined for Fiji, but we are being used as a you know as a, a, as a, um, a transit point. For these things and the, the major destination for these things is either Australia and usually or United States so that is why I'm saying that we, we, we need our foreign policy needs to be part of uh, defense policy we need to work with Australia and New Zealand and the United States defense forces to uh, make sure Fiji plays a integral Fiji defense forces plays an, in, plays an integral part in the Pacific theater uh, you know the, the 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 United States takes care of the North Pacific we have Australia and New Zealand and I think we could play a very significant role in the South Pacific and uh, funding for these reforms can come out of uh, these, these countries I think we need to sort of uh, engage our military more constructively uh, we need to sort of uh, develop a Coast Guard we need to um, uh, look after our you know resources we need to uh, uh, do our border control watch our uh, boundaries our economic zones and this is where we should be directing the you know energy of the military another you know, thing is you know let me give, you know give you an example uh, you know like hornets you know hornets uh, colony you know it's a colony and then you know it's similar to a country you know so they, they have soldier bees so when you, when you pass uh, uh, near the hornet uh, nest all the soldier bees will be point pointing outside looking at you ready to you know defend the colony over here regrettably every border you know soldiers are looking inwards so i think it's not on the honors on the military but it's the honors on the government if the government should have that resolve and that uh, you know ability to sit down with the military refocus our attention from uh, the land force to maritime because we are a maritime country there is a lot happening in our maritime area you know uh, it, it's a busy traffic for yachts a lot of these yachts you don't know what they are carrying Human trafficking destined for Australia, New Zealand, and the uh, United States happens through our waters. Drug trafficking happens through our waters. You know, the, the drugs, uh, you know, washing up to the shores of the islands is no accident. It is, it is, it is happening. So uh, if I would uh, have my way, I would make a, a military more strong on our maritime surveillance, our Navy more stronger, uh, uh, creates Coast Guard and, uh, you know, why base uh, all the naval ships in Walubay? They should be in North, uh, West and uh, in Kandabu in those areas, uh, sort of uh, patrolling our borders. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, you leave the military as it is, uh, you know, we, we, we likely to, you know, just have the same things happening over and over again. I think the onus is in the government of the day is to, you know, move the attention of the military from the internal affairs of the country to external. You know, and uh, let me say here one thing, Shashi. You know, you will look at uh, the BlackRock. You know, I, I, I'm very emotionally attached to I used to go there with my ambassador. Uh, there were bushes, nothing else, you know. The, the, and, you know, we used to look. I think the United States was very interested in developing the BlackRock. Uh, so it's a reality now. I haven't been there. The, uh, I've been talking to one of the senior officers whether I could come and visit the place because uh, that place was jungle. But today it is a very well-functioning facility that the Fijian military can use for so many things, you know, training our regional uh, forces. Uh, in fact, you know, I tell you the way, if, if we are, uh, if we uh, have the foresight and if we have the will, we could be more of a regional force, you know, looking after, you know, when uh, uh, Solomon Islands was banning, you know, we, we could have been there, you know, trying to diffuse the situation if we had that goodwill among, uh, you know, uh, island countries. But, you know, um, the military is here to remain. Um, military is uh, going to be an integral part of us. Uh, we had a lot of our men in uniform sacrifice their life. I understand their budget is very high. 
but you know we have to think uh, how we can best use that money to you know i have recently you know had a, um, a senior political leader of one party saying as soon as he gets elected he will uh, you know uh, reduce the budget of the military why poke uh, the fingers in the eyes yes you reduce the budget of the military but engage with them first then talk about reducing the budget or realigning their focus and i think you know with uh, blackrock now there i think we have the capability to uh, push or to move the our military our defense forces to a higher height where they can become a significant regional force rather than uh, just uh, hanging around in fiji okay um you've just you you've just confirmed what one of our previous guests dr nakarawa said in this program and that is that uh, he suggested that the military should be outward looking and that's exactly what you've harped on now you've just gone on and you've really summed up which is a thought that a lot of people have in terms of the role of the military in Fiji. Why do you think the powers that be are not listening? I think, you know... Is it, is it, leaders, is it, a, case, is it a case of vested interest? Uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know uh, I think there is a perception among political leaders that in order to survive politically, you need the military on your side. Um, you, 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 a lot of political leaders are using military as a weapon, you know, uh, I say it to say, but, you know, uh, let me be very blunt here. The military takes oath under the constitution not to protect an individual. They are to protect an uh, the, uh, the country and its people. That's where their loyalty lies. It, the moment any institution, um, uh, sort of uh, any political leader thinks that they have the military at their disposal, to protect the, his interest or for their own political survival, I think you know the military, Fijian military is uh, changing. Uh, the thinking is changing. You know, frankly, Shashi, you know, a majority of them would don't would not agree with me. But you know, military has gone through some very tough times, very tough times, very challenging times. You know what happened in 2000. Uh, so you can't bring these changes overnight. I think the military is very keen to move forward. Uh, they, they they take uh, their responsibility seriously. You know, let me give you an example. Just imagine during the you know attack in Washington uh, by the people, and you know, just imagine if uh, the U.S. military would have sided with those who were distracting the you know Congress and uh, was creating havoc in um, Washington D.C. Just imagine what would have happened. Just imagine if uh, the military would have sided with the uh, with the outgoing president. It didn't happen. And one of the senior officers, one of the highest ranking officers made a very strong comment and very valid comment that we can, we should learn from. He said, that, no, we don't take oath. This own uniform doesn't take oath to protect an individual. You know, it, it's not here to protect a politician. It is here to protect the country. It is here to protect the constitution. And I think this is where our military should be moving. Um, uh, we had, uh, you know, history of uh, 87. We had 2000. We have 2006. And I, I think, you know, uh, with the current leadership that is around, I think they are working very hard. I know all of them very personally. Uh, during my embassy days, I worked with them very closely. I, I, I engage with some of them. But I think we should, as uh, our people, you know, support our military to reform, to change, to uh, reach out to them. And I think the military has an obligation because the military is the fear factor. Frankly, you know, I don't know, you know, because I have worked for the U.S. Uh, the, uh, embassy, U.S. government, and I have worked very closely uh, with the Defense Department. I have been to Pentagon. I have been to 37 warships in uh, submarines here. Uh, I've seen Fijians and uh, Americans training together. You know, I, I think there is a very, uh, I, I feel that, you know, going forward, we will see a very professional military with uh, this. And now I, I can understand a lot of our officers are going to Australia and New Zealand, even at Hawaii for training. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, time to come, uh, will our military will be very professional. And I think the military has an obligation to reach out to the people, to reach out to the community and eliminate this fear factor. You know, just imagine the military is our institution. Our defense force belongs to us. And if we don't get comfort out of them, if, and if we see them as an element of fear, then there is something wrong. There is something, I think the military must look at its own uh, public diplomacy program, reach out to the people, stand with the people. And, you know, uh, their budget is no issue to me because, you know, in all other countries, military budget 
you know the government uh, taxpayers feed them uh, taxpayers uh, uh, you know sustain them but we know that a day might come that you know their life will uh, they will give their life to protect us but how we uh, handle that budget how we get uh, uh, money uh, retained out of the investment is not in the hands of the military it's in the hands of the government of the day how they engage with the military and how they try to reform and move the country forward and uh, not just uh, use them as something to you know just uh, provide security to their uh, survival as politicians all right um, a request from some viewers they'd like you to slow down a little bit you're going too fast thank you thank you i, I thought all so right um, okay so just slow down a little bit uh, that's the request from some viewers thank you my apologies now, no that's okay now you you mentioned the constitution and uh, the oath that uh, military officers take the constitution the 2013 constitution section 1312 of that constitution how does that resonate with you in that, that the military is to ensure at all times the security, defense, and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians? Are you concerned with this addition in the Constitution? You know, Shashi, if you really look at the role of other militaries, it's very similar. You know, if you look at the defense of the country, but, you know, in the real terms, if you really look at this constitution, 2013 constitution, I'm asking uh, what uh, provision of the constitution did Rambuka use in 1987? What provision of the constitution did uh, uh, the instigators of 2000 coup use? They did. So it's just a written thing. And it, it can be valuable in the sense it depends on the maturity of the defense force, our defense force. It depends on the professionalism of our defense force, and it depends upon the commander. As long as they are they confine themselves to the constitution of the country, they show their allegiance to the constitution, as long as they protect the country, you know, this, this is just a written uh, word. Uh, it's alarming. People think it's alarming, but I think it's very similar to other countries. But end of the day, it is it is about the defense force how they take their role and responsibility. It, it's a this constitution has given them a constitutional authority on things. Previously they didn't, but they did, still did it without any constitutional authority to overthrow the government. So um, uh, the the thing is, you know, this is something we have to live on, to live with uh, Shashi. This 2013 constitution is engraved in the stone. You know, normally you would think that a constitution is a living document. You know, when future generations think that uh, this provision of the constitution is uh, no longer uh, relevant to them, it's detrimental to them, they should be able to easily change it. It was easy to bring in 2013 constitution without a referendum, but then to change any aspect of the constitution, you can't, uh, you know, change it without referendum. And the referendum requirement is basically, uh, as I said, it's engraved in the stone. You can't change it. You know, it's just up to there. And, you know, this is the sad part of the constitution. You know, it, 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 there is uh, the, the 2013 constitution, in my personal view, has failed in all aspects. It, it, it is not uh, the, the, it was not a referendum taken by the people it was not endorsed by the people of this country uh, we we don't have any evidence of a majority of the people unless you take a referendum we don't know but uh, you know uh, in comparison to 1997 constitution which uh, had so much provision on uh, protection it's all there uh, you know I, I think such the constitution has the, it it depends who is running the government you know, the spirit of the constitution, that is a very important point. And whether this government is running this country in the spirit of the 2013 constitution, that is the question we should be asking. All right. Well, I'll come back and revisit this uh, after the elections with you in sure. terms of this uh, section 131.2, and we'll see what pans out then. Let me ask you, why is it that some politicians are reluctant to address the real issues in relation to the military in Fiji, is it a fear factor or is there something else at play or is it appeasement? Uh, no, it's not appeasement. Uh, and I, I I think it's not, it, it, somewhat it might be a fear factor, but I think it's a perception. 
I don't know, uh, Sashi, when I look at the military, I have a different view of them. You know, people talk to me, you know, uh, I, I don't consider myself very important, someone very important. But, uh, you know, some senior, senior officers always address me as say, I have uh, worked with them, as I said, in the Buni Dini Hills, in, uh, you know, joint military training exercises. Uh, I have uh, been very close. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you because I'm asking yeah. about politicians. Okay. Um, sure. why, why are some politicians reluctant? That's what I'm asking. Is it a fear factor or is there something else at play? Well, it, uh, when you talk about politicians, it depends on the different politicians as well. You know, uh, sometimes I'm asking, you know, uh, which politician has uh, been to the camp uh, or visited the armed forces uh, headquarters in the last 20 years. You know, so at the end of the day, I think it's a perception. Uh, people uh, need to sort of reach out to the military. Uh, those people using military as a fear factor should stop doing that. You know, I don't, I haven't, you know, initially, yes, you know, we have a, a situation where uh, people were taken to the camp, beaten up. I was one of them. I wasn't taken to the camp, but, you know, Felix was taken to the camp and uh, I was taken to the special branch. We were questioned and all those. But, you know, those officers uh, are slowly phasing out. Uh, those circumstances have slowly facing out they are now probably realizing the reality uh, there is a lot of effort being pushed towards developing the military but again you know it's in the hands of the politician how they reach out to the military you know you shun it you reach out i think you know you, you start shunning out then you have this uh, you know doubt in your mind mind you will never be able to sort of uh, step forward and do that. There are issues, as I said, I cannot discuss, but, you know, as I said, uh, Fiji needs a prime minister who can reach out to the military, talk to them, and, you know, the uh, military should have confidence in them as well. And who is that prime minister who has that gut or who guts and who has that resolve to sort of go and stand and talk to the military and, uh, you know, sort of work with them and reforming, reforming and moving them forward? So who do you think would be that prime minister? I'll reserve my comment on that. You know, let's see how politicians emerge. Who becomes the prime minister? And you know, I think the real real uh, scenario will be dependent on who becomes the prime minister. All right. Um, let's move towards uh, issues that affects the electorate. I'd like to discuss that with you as Fiji heads towards elections 2022. You, as you've said, you are currently not aligned with any political party. What do you think are the key issues affecting the electorate currently? Uh, I, I just um, let me qualify here, uh, Sashi. I am not trying to discredit any political party or trying to promote any party's political agenda. But I sit here, I should have made that clear in the beginning, I sit here for Fiji. Really, for not any political cause, but for Fiji. You know, this is what people are saying. You know, those who take my comments positively, thank you to them. They do, who, those who don't, uh, well, that's your freedom of choice. But this is what generally people feel. And, you know, I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the real uh, 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 situation in the country is not truly really reflected to the people. A lot of things are happening that is very detrimental to the country. You know, the, our health services have uh, collapsed. You know, there is uh, uh, basically, you know, we don't even have a PET scan in the country. Uh, uh, those um, uh, people suffering from cancer, I'm, I was reading a, a doctor's comment that majority of the cancer patients go into palliative care in this day and age. Uh, uh, the, the, the amputations of leg, you know, I had, you know, there were maggots in one of the guys, you know, we had a couple of days later, there were maggots in his leg. So, you know, this is not the Fiji we want. And, you know, this is not the Fiji that uh, the government wants to show. The government, if there is a problem, they must take responsibility. They must get people who are, have expelled the opposition, they must uh, get together and address this, pro uh, address this problem. An individual can't address this problem. Uh, and I, I think we have some very serious uh, scenario. We keep hiding it. Uh, we, 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 this thing will blow up in our face. You, you mentioned health, and amongst health, there are other issues that affect uh, Fiji, uh, such as poverty, uh, health, infrastructure, uh, cost of living issues. Let's look at a few of these. Uh, for example, how does this government or an incoming government tackle the poverty issue? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think, uh, Sashi, giving out money doesn't solve the poverty problem. It is 
basically, you know, uh, uh, strengthening our structures. You know, we we have been uh, uh, living on borrowed money. We were, uh, you know, did not uh, save for the rainy days. We thought everything is okay, economy is okay. But then COVID hits us. No, no fault of the government. But the fault of the government is that they did not save for the rainy days. And you probably remember in the height of the government, we could hardly hear anybody from the government talking about COVID issues. So we we have a situation where we are now living on borrowed money. Even our operational cost is on borrowed money. People are not being empowered. Uh, let me give you one example. The, the Nanuku settlement, which is close to me, uh, in 2018, uh, the government, uh, Fijian government, uh, promised Nanuku that they will move uh, the settlement, the settlement uh, to another place where they'll have their land of their own, and they will sort of uh, uh, build their own home. The money will be, I think, it was Bindi subdivision. To date, nothing has happened. They are all lying idle. They are, don't know what to do. They don't don't, don't have any, uh, uh, you know. Um, goals in life, they're just waiting for government to move and another, another election has come around. Nothing is happening. People are being left high, uh, idle. Uh, you go into squatter settlements, it's Indian, Fijians, everybody, you know, no, nobody's spared. So uh, I think the government has spent a lot of money here and there. You know, the problem is the biggest problem with this government is the politics of appeasement. You know, you can't appease all the people. And when you die, you know, divert uh, uh, critical resources uh, uh, of our country to appease people, uh, it, it is going to create a lot of problems. And I think that is what we're going through now. Cost of living. It's a day-to-day -day dilemma for a very, very large portion of the Fijian population. What do you think needs to be done to ease the pressures of cost of living? Uh, Again, you know, uh, uh, Shashi, it comes to the same same thing. Uh, we hardly produce anything locally. Everything is imported. Majority of it is imported. Um, uh, we need to sort of revive our local economy. Uh, we need to sort of be self-sufficient in a lot of things. Uh, the COVID has taught us, you know, the borders can close down and we can pay, say, save some serious problem. Give me, let me give you one example. Uh, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture went out and uh, in past two years have been uh, going out and encouraging farmers to plant pineapples. So we will get machines to process things here. We'll take out juice here. And the, the cassava farmers were encouraged, people were encouraged to pl uh, plant cassava so that, you know, the cassava would be bought and we'll make flour out of the uh, cassava. Nothing of that sort happened. Last year, people were selling uh, pineapples for 50 cents or 30 cents because it was oversupplied. There was no machine for juice. Yeah, we still import uh, uh, sliced pineapples. We still import uh, pineapple juices. Uh, and, you know, the thing is uh, uh, the, 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 the local economy, as I said, it's politics of appeasement. We are not uh, investing into sector where we should be st uh, spending, making our economy strong, uh, um, uh, uh, our local economy strong, uh, drive our local sector. We have been chasing stars um, and chasing after things that's non-existence. We should uh, step back, get back to basics, focus on developing our local economy. There is, uh, there is no reason why we should be um, uh, importing dry coconuts from abroad, why we should be importing uh, coconut juices, why we can't plant capsicum over here. You know, all, all these things has to come back to one thing, developing our local economy our local structure and developing niche product. Look at Fiji water, look at Piwa Fiji. You know, the, look at the niche factor. We have a ginger, uh, sep, uh, you know, uh, thousands and tons of ginger, but we, we export whole ginger. You know, it's time we should do downstream from uh, processing, get more out of it, uh, leave up to your vote. If you say we are going to, to buy all your cassava and turn into this flower, do so, you know, you know, tons of cassava lying over one farmer in Lasuri and Talibu was telling me he basically the, uh, selling uh, cassava at $20 a bag. It's, it's occupying his uh, land. It's waste of uh, time. He, it's a space. Uh, he wants to plant something else. So he's used the digger to dig the cassava and then uh, push it aside. And whoever wants to take it, take it. So, you know, um, end of the day, the government uh, should face the reality uh, on the ground and uh, try to develop our local economy. All right. One subject that I always dread to discuss uh, with my guests is in relation to the health crisis in Fiji. Let me at this juncture, though, praise the efforts of Fiji's very own Sumith Tapu and his uh, Sri Satya Sai organization for uh, the Children's Hospital Project in Fiji. Sumith and his organization have shown that when humans 
set their minds and spirits into something for the betterment of mankind, anything is possible. All surgeries and treatments uh, at the children's hospital is conducted free of cost to the children or their families. Now, compare that to the plight that we see in our public hospitals in Fiji. For instance, the sorry state of the CWM hospital. Look at the La Toka hospital. The list just goes on. How does one address the healthcare system in Fiji? Um, definitely not by bringing in SPAN. You know, currently the government has given SPAN to run, run uh, La Toka and Bar hospitals. Uh, and they came in. Uh, FNPF is the partner, and I think they borrowed from FNPF uh, to, you know, build the hospital, uh, build its capacity. I understand the uh, hospital is not going to make any money out of uh, this. Uh, the hospital, this investment for next 10 years, uh, we should be, uh, you know, looking at not only Fiji, but as a region. For example, let me tell you here, uh, uh, Shashi, uh, the Apollo Hospital, for example, there has been a lot of talk going about Apollo Hospital to, uh, to uh, you know, to operate in Fiji. They had shown interest. I think there was some work. We need to sort of get a very high profile hospital uh, like Apollo into the country. They have the uh, manpower. They have uh, doctors specializing in various fields. They have the equipment. So end of the day, all these patients we are sending to India for treatment or to foreign countries for treatment, those treatment could be done here at the fraction of the cost. And we can also provide that service to the Pacific Island countries, you know, the Tonga, Tuvalu, Nauru. So it, this will be bringing in money and at the same time providing uh, top of the range medical services to our people. We have, our people are leaving, our doctors are leaving, our qualified technicians are leaving. I, I asked one of the, um, the senior officials of the Ministry of Health, why can't we have PET scan? But pets, you know, Fiji. If we are claiming to be a developed country, you know, a developing country, if we have to, we have our state of the art um, technology here. Then what? Why Fiji can't have a pet scan? We don't. But they, there, there are. They said we don't have the technician to look after that. You know. So where are all these technicians going? The only way we can improve the health system is by bringing in technology and manpower from outside. And Fiji, can, uh, we can be smart enough to make sure that services are provided to Australia. And the, even I tell you, sometimes people from you know, all the way United come, States come here for dental services. So if we are competent enough, if the hospital that is established here is competent enough, we can get enough clients from the Pacific Island countries and other foreign countries to come and use that facility here. That will pour in money. It, 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 uh, there is a, uh, India uses them as a medical tourism. Fiji could become a hub for the medical tourism for the Pacific Island countries. And we, we should be exploring that. That is the only way we can improve our health system here. Well said. You're a farmer. Your parents, your grandparents come from a farming background. When you look at the sugar industry today, what goes through your mind? Do you think the sugar industry can really be revived or is it a lost cause? <laughs> Let me be, I, I'm a sugarcane farmer. I come from that background. My father only worked hard on the sugarcane farming, sugarcane farm, so that he can educate me. My One of my brother pulled out from the school. He helped my dad. The day I gave my first packet, pay packet to my mom, my father said, okay, this is it. Sugarcane farming was an industry for our grandparents. Our children don't want to hear about sugarcane farming. If you think we can encourage people to go back and do sugarcane farming, I think that there's so much educational opportunities now. Uh, and, you know, a, 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 a child of a farmer, if he can't make it to the school system, he thinks he'll be better off uh, picking onions and potatoes in Rajendra supermarket than to go and do hard work on the sugarcane farm. It's a dead, it's not a dead cause. It's a government must act decisively. Don't, I don't think far, you can get farmers back to uh, sugarcane farming. It is an industry that is very important. It is an industry where the entire uh, the foreign exchange remains in the country. You know, we have tourism. We give so much uh, hype about the tourism, uh, but, uh, but people don't realize uh, for, from every dollar, 75 cents of that dollar goes out of the country. 
uh, there is employment benefit. You know, there are so much tax incentive to them. We give them marketing uh, budget. But, you know, sugar industry proceeds from the sugar industry, remains in the country and goes to the very people that need it. It goes to the grassroots. So government has to re-look re -look at the sugar industry. They, there is land available and uh, the weather is there. Government has to move from farmers to forming a cooperative. It must be run as an industry. For example, my sector, Lomwai sector, could be a, a, a business co component. You know, they could hire people, and, you know, they go and plant sugarcane, they look after the sugarcane, uh, they run it as an industry. And then have a gift when they harvest, then, you know, they can give the farmer's share and the rest, you know, to, it, 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 should, it has to be run as a corporate organization. To depend, to get our people back to farming, I, I think we are running after a lost cause. It, it was, as I said, grandparents' uh, industry, and our, our father and grandfather would only work on the farm until such time there is another income coming from somewhere. And then they say, okay, this is it. You know, it's funny, majority of people, farmers you talk to today, they use it, use it, use cane farming as a leisure industry. You know, you have nothing to do in the village. You go and harvest the cane. Then, you know, you have a break. You go and sit, sit in the shed. You have a couple of uh, balls of grog. And then, you know, you get the cart. You fill the cart. And, you know, you get two, uh, two bags of sugar in a year, two bags of uh, rice. That's all. That, 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 that. It is a pastime industry now, you know. Uh, but, you know, as I said, it's a very viable industry. It, it is something that we have to look differently now as a commercial uh, enterprise rather than getting farmers. I don't think we, we, we can get farmers uh, interested back into farm uh, with tenure of the land and you know all these issues coming. We don't own the land. Um, the Fijian, uh, the Atoki people who own the land, I think they are better off working in the uh, tourism industry. You know that's why you have seen all uh, uh, the, most of the farms have turned into jungles. So it, it, the sugar industry is lost course, but we cannot uh, let it go. It's very important. I think, you know, we can revive it. We need a vision. We need people uh, who believes in the industry, but we need a different approach, a more co corporate structure approach to sugarcane uh, industry. Normally in the old days, there used to be advisory boards. Uh, for example, you talked uh, just a moment ago about your Lomawai sector. Now, you mentioned forming of cooperatives. People in a local area would know what works for them better. People in a local area make their own judgments, their own calls. Now, under this current administration, this current government, local governments have been removed, for instance. Uh, it's top-heavy power. Do you think there is a need to go back to the basics where advisory boards, for example, in the Singatoka sector, in the Mba sector, these advisory boards are people from the area that they can take policy initiatives or suggestions to the central power base. Do you think that's needed again? You know, uh, Shashi, like the previous days, you know, we used to have advisory council. We have to have regular uh, meetings. Uh, the advisory council knew what uh, was going on the ground. You know, the uh, Fijian Affairs had their own um, uh, provincial councils. The government relied on uh, this, uh, you know, it, it was like uh, going in for information, going from bottom to top, and the government sort of uh, analyzing that information and then passing on uh, assistance from uh, up to down to the people who needed based on what they needed. Uh, these days it's quite different. It's uh, everything is concentrated. You know, we need uh, concentrated among the uh, hands of the few people. It is most of the things are in the hands of the central government. And central government is overwhelmed. And that, that is why things are falling apart. You know, uh, who else can decide better to run their municipality than the ratepayers? They have, should have a say at the moment. They don't have a say. Who, who has a better uh, ability to tell people, uh, to tell the government where the weakness or where the assistance is needed than advisory council or the provincial councils? Because they are on the ground. And, uh, and unfortunately, that system is no longer there. It's a very small group of people controlling the entire country and, you know, uh, having multiple portfolios. You know, there is uh, uh, the, the uh, things that civil servants uh, are normally doing. We see ministers are doing, you know, we pay them 200,000 salary a year and we find ministers going and handing out, uh, you know, houses and, you know, farming implements. 
uh, these things were before done by our district officers, our provincial council members, uh, and you know, politicians uh, didn't get involved in this type of things. But uh, these days, you know, I think there is a there should be exchange a role. Permanent secretaries should be policy makers, and um, uh, the politicians or ministers should be actually doing the uh, implementing the policy. The, the roles have changed quite uh, quite versa. Education is now becoming a discussion matter in Fiji. Uh, is education in, in a crisis in Fiji, or do you think it's on an even keel? I ask you that. Uh, for example, uh, the USP, you mentioned that when we're talking about regional solidarity, etc. But the USP is an issue for thousands of students. Then there is the T uh, TESOL loans, etc. I've got a lady who's been writing to me to say that her daughter wants to engage in an MBBS program. However, she cannot get a scholarship or she cannot get a loan, etc. What are your views on the, on the education crisis? I, I will not go on the individual uh, issues, uh, individual uh, cases. But generally, I think, you know, lately I had, you know, um, uh, the Fiji Teachers Union talking about problem of discipline in school. Uh, this, this is one uh, indicator that there is something wrong. Uh, we have a issue where there is no communication between the ministry and the committee uh, who actually run the school. Uh, there is uh, no consultation. I understand it's a heavy handedness. Um, I, I can't understand uh, why uh, the uh, government uh, doesn't give TELS uh, uh, loan uh, scheme for, I uh, uh, understand, the uh, foundation students, but uh, uh, the uh, Form 7 students qualify. Why the difference? You know, I think the quality of uh, our foundation program is very superior. Why uh, uh, penalize uh, uh, Fijian students who want to do foundation program and uh, reward the students who do Form 7? I, I don't see the logic and nobody has explained to me why the decision was made. Um, uh, when it comes to USP, I think, you know, Fiji gets eight times more than what it is contributing in terms of the benefit. Uh, if I'm, and I, I might not be um, accurate on the figure, but I think it's around eight times more than what Fijian government uh, contributes in terms of uh, employment, in terms of uh, the rental of, uh, of properties. And so, so USP is, uh, is a money-making thing for uh, uh, Fiji. But uh, coming back to education, I think, you know, the, the, they have organized some sort of consultations uh, lately, but it was such a hush thing. Nobody knew what happened. There was no planned consultation. I think that uh, the, there needs to be stakeholder involvement. Uh, I don't think it will have happen under this government because of its heavy handedness. I think when the new government, whatever, whoever, whichever government gets elected next, must stay engage all the stakeholders. And stakeholders means parents, uh, the committee, uh, the teachers, teacher unions, and and and. Um, and the, and the government, we, we need to uh, collectively take head on uh, the crisis facing our educational system. Now, uh, coming back to TELS, uh, the only thing I uh, now I think the uh, TELS is a great scheme. A lot of uh, students don't have access to funds uh, to educate themselves. But uh, I think it's after, comp after they complete their studies, the man debt management is an issue uh, that needs to be addressed. You know, a lot of students uh, uh, can't get jobs. Uh, to pay their loan back, uh, and uh, you know the situation. There has been situation where grantors have been put on um, the departure provision order, so they, it is creating a lot of mess. I hope they clear this. You know there is a clear guideline, uh, and and and, and uh, the government has to really look whether to give the cash in the hands of the student or directly pay the fees, and you know the if they're staying in hostel. Uh, because I, I know a number of uh, people who get the uh, their TELS allowance uh, end up uh, using where it should not be used. So it, it has to be re-looked at the same time. And here, Sashi, one thing I would like to do is, you know, exporting our human capital. We are saying, you know, I think the, at the moment TELS owes, owes about 571 million. TELS students are out the government about 571 million. I think they have collected something around 23 million. The balance remains. And most of them, these people will not be able to pay because there is no jobs locally for them to get a job and get the pay and then, you know, uh, pay their loan. I think this is where the government should come take the risk 
it, it is our our citizens, and if they are making a better future, let them be. But you know, we can have uh, the, the FRCs could have an arrangement with uh, you know they have this um, uh, tax arrangement you know uh, with uh, countries like Australia, New Zealand, and let our people who have qualified with uh, tells you know let them go and work in foreign countries, give them freedom to go because there is lack of employment here. And let them pay from there, you know, that there can be an arrangement done where they are, because I think, you know, if you have a job, I think it's important for you to pay your loan back so that other students can gain out of it. So I, I think TELS is an important program, but this whole management has, uh, has failed. All right, let's change this subject. Um, in any democratic country, it is the duty and responsibility of the government of the day to ensure that its citizens are free that they have the freedom to express uh, themselves with free speech, that they can openly criticize the government if it comes to that, if they feel that actions of the government deserve such criticism. However, many, many of my guests on SSTP have openly expressed that in Fiji, there is an apprehension amongst the general population. My question to you is, why is there this apprehension of fear? Is it just a figment of imagination or... Is it a fact of life? I think it's a fact of life. Uh, the fear factor is real. Uh, uh, you know, I have uh, been in the forefront of the Fijian politics for more than three decades, uh, and the fear factor is real. We, I've never seen, uh, you know, uh, I, I am normally seen to be speaking against the government. Uh, I'm not anti AG or anti prime minister. I am anti government and I'm pro Fiji, and some of the policies of the government is not uh, good. But you know, there is really a very strong fear factor. You know, uh, uh, people will not discuss openly issues openly. Uh, I don't know where this fear is coming from. Uh, this is uh, where it's very important that the institutions of the uh, institutions of the state don't even uh, create a perception of bias or uh, a perception of fear mongering. Uh, that they should stand on the side of the people. They should back off. And uh, the important thing is uh, here, you know, uh, never before. I, if I, if I'll give you an example. If I go to a cocktail, you know, people will come to me, you know, say a few things and then disappear, then get scattered. You know, nobody wants to be seen, you know, like don't know, nobody wants to be seen with Biman, uh, you know, nobody wants to be seen with Mahendra Choudhury. You know, I, I don't know, you know, that that is not the Fiji I ever saw. And I, it's very unfortunate that this is the Fiji we have now, where people fear their own government. You know, just imagine in a democratic country, when people start fearing their own government, it is, it is very sad and it is very dangerous. You know, there is a saying, um, it is very dangerous when you are right and the government is wrong. You know, so I, I think the fear factor over here is uh, very real. It's very detrimental. It has uh, uh, destroyed goodwill. It has destroyed, um, you know, relationship among family members, among business colleagues. You know, this this is a Fiji that, uh, you know, we shouldn't allow to, you know, as I said, you know, this election is so critical. Uh, if we don't change things the way it is going, uh, this will become a culture, you know, that it will become a culture where uh, uh, it will become an exclusive government rather than an inclusive government. And a lot of people will just lose hope. Um, children will migrate and, you know, uh, that, that, that uh, the goodwill, you know, Fiji, you know, is known for so much goodwill, you know, among grassroots, you know. You know, we went through four, three to three coups, but let me tell you, you know, it's the perseverance and goodwill among the grassroots that held this country together, not the politician or the political leaders. It's the goodwill among grassroots people. And unfortunately, today, you know, people can't talk about politics, talk about their government, talk about national issues, even in a grok session, because nobody knows who is who is on whose side. So, you know, I, I think, you know, this is a sad state of affairs. Uh, I, I don't know whether the prime minister knows this, but, you know, I'm looking into his eyes now. If he's watching in the program, I'm looking into his eyes now and telling me, Mr. Prime Minister, telling him, Mr. Prime Minister, people fear your government. This is not the government you promised to this country. And I'm telling you as without any political agenda, without any negative uh, attitude towards it, this is the reality. People fear our government, and it, it is a sad state of their affairs when people start fearing their own government. 
Nirmal, how does one then come to terms with this element of fear and overcome the same? I, I think, you know, it's not on the people. You know, uh, uh, our uh, people, uh, you know, those days are gone uh, where people will uh, march to towns and create instability, you know, sort of uh, rise, you know, Fiji. I think uh, the, there is a different generation here now. Uh, they are watching. Uh, as I said, you know, it is very important that, you know, we must stop this culture, we put that political over that is imaging in our country. We must put a stop. Uh, the only way we can achieve this is by empowering our people, by the, by sort of uh, giving them the uh, assurance. And the, a lot depends on the institutions of the state. Uh, they even shouldn't create a perception of bias. They shouldn't create a perception of being fearful, uh, that our people become very fear fearful. Everybody has to play a role. You know, our country, our people, and the, the dissent, the, the right to dissent, uh, the right to disagree with our government, the right to protest with our government is our fundamental right. As I said, we can hate our government, but we should never do anything that will damage our country or harm our country. But our government at the moment has failed to live with the, uh, with the expect uh, that to the expectation of the people. And you know, I, I don't I don't see any further hope in them. I don't think they will change course. The only course have for the people is to um, send uh, into parliament those that they will. Uh, build consensus, will uh, meet the expectation of the electorate and the people of this country and uh, move uh, Fiji forward and get back to Fiji where I used to be. All right. Uh, people have uh, fear in their hearts. What about non-government organizations? Uh, what about the NGOs? Is there fear amongst the NGO community as well? Some have told me that uh, there are certain NGO uh, uh, organizations that are fearful of this government and uh, the controls that they have? Uh, you know, um, uh, Sashi, you'd be aware uh, during our days before this government, we had Citizens Constitutional Forum, uh, we had human rights uh, NGOs, we had um, a women's rights movement. You know, uh, where have these organizations gone? You know, where are these organizations? They were so vocal, you know, the, even the we had media council, you know, the Fiji media council. You know, I, I just wonder where they have gone, you know, gone. The recently, you know, government passed a bill that will, uh, you know, adversely affect the media freedom in this country. It, it will basically, you know, uh, uh, it might affect uh, one media outlet uh, in near term, but it eventually it will affect everybody. But not a word. not a word from any media organization. You know, everybody accepted and moved on. I think it is uh, important, you know, tell me, Shashi, uh, uh, your namesake, Shashi from uh, French Foundation, for example. Mm -hmm. Shashi Kiran. Shashi Kiran, uh, you know, she could be an asset to the government. You know, who would know better the poverty situation in our country? Who would know better about alternative livelihood? Then Shashi, then French Foundation. You know, they are in the field. Government should be using them. Not marginalizing and, them, and yet you know, the government attacks attacks the hard work done. Yeah, it, it, by is said, it is said. It is said. You know, we, we no government should do that. Uh, uh, now we have um, you know people organizing democracy movements and all those things, but you know they confine themselves to be very you know soft subjects. Uh, here, uh, citizens constitutional forum. I don't know if they are in existence or not, but you know, government previous government always used the NGOs used NGOs to get the sound, you know, it's like, you know, to get the feel of what is happening. You know, they used to engage, they used to argue, you know, they used to protest that there, there was rough times, but they were given the floor to talk to the government to express their views. Uh, it's gone. As I said, this is an exclusive government and not an inclusive government anymore. So I, I feel bad for NGOs, but I, I feel eventually, you know, we will be able to get these guys to, you know, give them the recognition they deserve and, uh, you know, uh, get the NGOs involved again. All right. Have a little break. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, And our chief guest today is Mr. Nirmal Singh Chima, who has had 16 years of experience in the American embassy in Suva as a political and public affairs specialist, as well as in trade and investment in Fiji. Don't forget you can view this program at any time on Facebook, 
or on YouTube. Now I'm going to ask you about the Fiji First Government. It's time to discuss with you the performance of the current government. Firstly, on a score of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest, how would you rate their performance in the last 16 years? You know, when they initially started, uh, uh, Shashi, I would have uh, given them 8. You know, but uh, uh, they started very well. Uh, then, you know, things uh, started to get bad, you know, and today I would probably give them three. There are sectors of the community in Fiji, Nirmal, which uh, thinks that this is the gov best government in Fiji's history. These people say that no other government have, uh, has been this good. What would you say to this sentiment expressed by some sectors in the community? Well, I think, you know, some of the feelings is um, uh, accurate in the sense that, you know, uh, we have suffered so many coups uh, and uh, people couldn't decide, you know, what to do in Fiji. You know, but the, there was no stability. Uh, there was a lot of instabilities uh, uh, since 87, 2000 and then 2006. Uh, there, people need a sense of security, a sense of stability. And uh, I think Fiji First government has given that. So a lot of people think, you know, it's stable. You know, uh, 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 that there is no uprising, there is no instability, there is no movement trying to disturb the country. But we we have to, and uh, another issue, people are happy because the loan element, you know, because there is indiscriminate, there is discriminatory borrowing. People, uh, government borrows and is pushing money into the sector. So people think everything is okay, but our time will come, we'll have to pay that loan. We'll have to pay that, pay, pay that money. So because the loan that uh, the debt that we are uh, accumulating is not reflected in people's uh, bank account so people don't care if whether fiji is in 10 million debt or 20 million debt they don't care uh, uh, because you know end of the day it's not reflected in their bank account so this government has been borrowing and pushing money into the sector giving cash and all those things but you know eventually people are realizing that this is not the country they want this is not the leadership they want uh, it has slided into something that uh, Fiji should have never gone into. And uh, I think that's where I'm saying if change is coming, things will change for better. You mentioned uh, that uh, stability is something good that this government has done. Where else do you think they have excelled in? Remember, I, you, scored, I, you, you scored them three. I, I think there has been a decline uh, because uh, as time passed by, uh, by uh, we have seen uh, more of the decisions coming from an individual than collectively by the government. You know, when I talk about the government, I talk about opposition as well. The members of the parliament form the government, you know, the Fiji Fest has a cabinet. But uh, they have been running their uh, government on their own. Uh, there is no uh, planning office. Uh, there is no development plan. Things are being run in the head of MENA. And I think, you know, that is where things are breaking down. For example, let me say this Nasese Road. I have been always very, you know, vocal about it. Uh, the upgrading of the is waste of money because, you know, people, uh, businesses are moving uh, the... Uh, uh, departmental stores, the supermarkets are moving where people are. Uh, in about five to ten years, uh, the Suva will only become a head of the government, a seat of the government. Uh, otherwise, the supermarkets and all, all will be moving uh, to Narere and other areas. So you can see the, the level of development in Nasori Suva sector. So I think a lot of people will be moving. So the, all the money we are wasting in Nasese could have been well spent somewhere else. So it, it all... Th things have been started breaking down because there is no system now. Okay. Um, failure of this government on many fronts. What's your views? Uh, they could have done a lot better. But uh, uh, I, I think this government has failed to meet the expectations of the lot of people of this country. All right. Let me now discuss with you some of your writings on your Facebook timeline. You recently posted, and uh, I will quote, you wrote, This government for more than a decade has spat on our face, 
and has treated us with contempt. It has made laws and acted in a manner contrary to the best interest of our people and country. It has weakened our institutions of state by demanding loyalty to them than the state. It's been indiscriminately creating a new political order in our country, and we watch in complete silence. All we can do is issue press statements and make statements in Parliament, and this government knows that this is all we can do. Talk. End of quote. What prompted you to write this, and who was this target to? Was it targeted to the opposition parties? Uh, well, in some way to the opposition parties, but you know, Shashi, the sanctity of the laws uh, can only be credible only so long it has the expression, express interest of the will of the people. Now, look at Section 50. I think that is the section that uh, the government uses to pass bills in parliament that is rushed through with no consultation with the oh, people. Standing, standing Order 51. Standing Order 51. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you for yeah. correcting me. So, you mm. know, that uh, section has uh, been used to pass some very important and critical bills that affect people. And as I said, the sanctity of the law uh, can only be credible if, uh, you know, so long as it has the express of, expression of the will of the people. So if the government has the majority, any government which has the majority, it has a very serious responsibility to make sure it makes laws that is in the benefit of the people and not use certain sections of the parliament to rush in bills without consulting the people. And as I said, you know, I mean, all we can do is talk about it. You know, there is uh, nothing we can do because, you know, the, as I said, you know, the parliament is not being run in the spirit uh, uh, that it should. You know, the opposition uh, are basically, uh, they stand up and give uh, their statement and speeches, but that's all they do. And it is said, and you know, I think it's the, it's, it's the weakness on both parts uh, that there is no engagement between the opposition and the government. And uh, I just imagine if there is a change of government and uh, Fiji Fest is sitting on the other side and the, the, one of the opposition parties sitting uh, on the government side, I hope this thing will stop and they, they will reach across the aisles and sort of uh, be uh, accommodating to each other. Under the present circumstances, what else can the opposition do? I mean, the, the way the whole parliament is structured in terms of debate, in terms of the allocation of time, you mentioned Standing Orders uh, 51. What else can an opposition member do? Just stand up there and talk, at least get uh, his or her uh, opinion heard or documented. I, I agree with you, Sashi. I think, you know, um, it, the onus is on the government. They have the majority. I think the onus uh, was always with the government to reach out. Uh, but the prime minister is on record on saying that, you know, let's work together. The opposition should work together. But, you know, in practice, it doesn't happen. So I, I agree with you. There is very little the opposition can do or very little uh, the trade union movement could do. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, uh, I just see, you know, uh, it's just uh, for trade union or any body for that matter. It's just the position that is left. There is no membership. I, I mean, there is no following. Uh, nobody, you know, speaks. Everybody is quiet. So, you know, you hear a statement one in a while. Very important for the country, but there is uh, no one to listen. All right. You said that the government has treated us with contempt. What did you mean by this? Uh, exactly what I said, you know, because they have been making laws, you know, previously we had parliamentary committees going out and talking to the people, hearing their views uh, before a law would be legislated. These days, you know, as I said, Section 51 is used uh, to push through laws that should actually go back to the people, should have uh, the endorsement of the people. Uh, just getting your majority in the parliament, uh, forming the government, uh, comes with great responsibility. It doesn't give you a blank check to whatever one you, you, you want to do, you can do it. So I think the responsibility lies with the government to create any government for that matter. To If you already have the majority, it is your responsibility, the onus in you, is on you to reach out uh, to the other side of the aisles, aisles and run the country collectively. It's a strength. Opposition should be treated as a strength rather than as a, a, a as a weakness or as a adversary. You mentioned a new political order. What is this new political order? 
as i said you know shashi when i mean about talk about the new political order you know everybody is watching you know this is uh, we are actually having an exclusive government rather than an inclusive government uh, we have very few people running affairs of the country as i said the town councils are all you know run by through the ministry of local government uh, i don't know what is happening to the uh, advisory council so this new political order uh concentrates power on the top you know it doesn't sort of uh, trickle down to the people who should be actually be advising the government uh, feeling involved and feel part of the governance all right which brings me to another facebook piece you wrote where you paid respect to the permanent secretaries senior public servants and others who ensure public service machinery operates efficiently you went further on to say that the senior civil servants have been made irrelevant and work under very marred civil service environment their work has been taken over by some ministers you said the hierarchy and change of command is in name only you also said that previously a permanent secretary may refuse to honor a directive from a minister because it was against civil service procedures today they will be fired on the spot you called it a sad state of affairs there mo how did things get this bad well i think you know it's a demarcation of the role you know a minister makes uh, uh, the minister makes policies the government makes policies and the permanent secretary implement policies uh, i feel that you know uh, ministers have basically uh, taken over the jobs of the permanent secretary uh, th that is my feeling uh, they are in the field most of the time while they should be making policies and i think this is uh, the way it's uh, uh, you know there there is lack of uh, direction for the country uh, you know uh, the, the uh, for example in the agriculture sector the field officers used to be in the field all the time you hardly see field officers anymore it's ministers handing out ministers on the field so i i th i think you know that's why i'm saying the permanent secretary secretaries are working under a lot of uh, tight situation uh, they are uh, sort of uh, i i praise them that they you know given the circumstances they have held uh, the fort uh, for uh, such a long time and uh, i hope a good day again i think they they will be empowered their power will be restored and you know that there can be clear demarcation of a role of a minister and a permanent secretary and a civil service so the solution to restore that confidence and that sense of empowerment empowerment back to the civil servants uh, civil service does it only come if the government changes it's it depends on the election as i said you know if uh, the current government continues i don't see there will be any change it will become part of the culture of the new norm but uh, a new government coming in i don't know which you know it all depends on the government of the day how they respond to the situation whether they continue as it is or they they uh, they, they, they have a clear become demarcation of their role as a government and those uh, in the public service normally you also wrote in one of your posts that some of your friends told you to be positive sometimes on your facebook postings you then wrote and i quote how can i be positive when there is so much unfairness so much influence of one person who decides our fate every day so much violation of our constitutional rights and so much ignorance by the state institutions that should be protecting our citizenry and so much of atrocities all around us if we don't stand up and fight against this and protect our future generations then what kind of legacy we are leaving behind being silent is being as guilty as those committing crimes against the soul of our nation end of quote my question is how can one stand up and fight against the atrocities that you wrote about i'll just answer it in a simple word our votes okay it is I, how I, we I, I, this yeah. this i think that's what i'm saying here uh, shashi this election is not about any political party or about this election is about fiji that's what i always say let's vote for fiji in this election and this this the only way we can bring about change all right well that choice is up to the people of fiji exactly. uh, to exercise their democratic rights to vote on election day 
And at the end of the day, the result they get is what they deserve. Would you agree exactly. with that summation? Exactly, because you know, if, if the people, uh, it's the people that uh, they vote, and they deserve the government that they vote for. You mentioned legacy. Let me ask you, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind for your children and your grandchildren? Look, you know, I uh, one may be a senior civil servant today. Uh, one might be a uh, very successful uh, military officer. Uh, one might be very successful police, uh, senior police officer. One might be sec very successful executive. But, you know, do we think, uh, you know, how uh, my, our children may not be so lucky. Things might change. Uh, the environment might change. The, uh, the, the entire economic environment, a lot of things can change. So what do we want? We leave, uh, my father, our parents uh, didn't live for themselves. They live for us. And, you know, we shouldn't be living for ourselves. We must be creating a country that our future generations could be proud of. Uh, we should not be, we should be living for our future generations, not living for the, on them. Uh, you know, the death situation is basically we are going to pass on to our future generations. So, you know, we must um, uh, evolve this country into a nation where our future generations can have, can have a better life than we have. So you want to leave a legacy, which is a, a better Fiji. A better Fiji and a better Fiji, a better Fiji for my children than I had. All right. Uh, let us look at the ever-rising debt levels in Fiji. The current debt level sits at an estimate of just around $11 billion and rising. Given the issues of the cost of living, the poverty crisis in the nation, the chronic state of the health services, and many, many, many more problems facing the nation. What are your views on the debt situation in Fiji? I think yesterday, Professor Biman Prasad said by the end of 2022-2023 uh, financial year, each man, woman, and child in Fiji will owe something like $11,000. Uh, Shashi, frankly, our debt is unsustainable. And the problem is we are, you know, we keep borrowing. We talk about smart borrowing, but we are borrowing. We have to pay that money back. And I don't see a single industry at the moment in Fiji that could help us to repay, uh, to pay that uh, loan off. And I think we are heading into some very dangerous waters uh, as far as sustainability of our debt is concerned. Uh, our, uh, like sugar industry is collapsing. Uh, as I said, 75 cents in every dollar from tourism goes out of the country. So I'm, I'm thinking, where will the money come from for us to pay the debt? We, we, we can get into very serious uh, situation. And I think, you know, we should learn to live within our means. We should really look at uh, capital project development that we are doing, whether, you know, it's sustainable to continue with that project. We must, at the moment, should be consolidating our debt. We must be consolidating our country. We must be consolidating our economy, not trying to, you know, uh, spend more, pump in more money. Uh, government all over the world sometimes have to pump, pump money into the system to uh, jumpstart the economy. We have been pumping money into the system 2006, but, you know, we, we did not jumpstart the economy. It is getting worse and our time will come. We might have a serious uh, problem of uh, not able to uh, service our debt. So is the borrowing conducted by the government responsible borrowing? There is, I don't know, there is a word they currently use, smart borrowing, you know, and every time a, a loan agreement is signed, there is a lot of, um, you, know, maybe, you know, a lot of press coverage, you know, uh, talking about uh, these institutions having confidence in uh, Fiji's economy. But, you know, end of the day, we have to pay that loan back. You know, it's not free money, whether it's one point interest, you know, or two point interest, we have to pay that money. And how long are we going to keep borrowing to meet our operational cost and uh, how long we are going to borrow to sustain ourselves? We have to bite the bullet, have, make some tough decisions. You know, we should arrest the rising debt situation and stop borrowing for operational cost. It's tough time, but, you know, I think... Uh, right from the beginning, we have been throwing out money and we have got into culture of spending uh, ruthlessly. You mentioned a little while ago that uh, people don't give a damn about the debt uh, situation of the country because it doesn't reflect in their own uh, bank statements, so to say. 
Um, having said that, you know very well that when you borrow money, you have to pay it back. My question is then, what burden do you think the future generations will inherit from the current debt crisis, the current debt levels? I cannot answer that question, Shashi. You know, it is frightening. It is really frightening. I don't know where the money is going to come from when our uh, important sectors are not performing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's something uh, everybody is talking about, how we are going to service our debt. And this is something that, uh, you know, it's for it. I'm not an economist, but I, I, I as a layman, I don't see a single in the sector that is performing or a single sector that has promised uh, to become a uh, to image to save uh, to be capable of servicing our debt. All right. Uh, as we head to the home front, uh, to the finishing line, I'm going to come back to the topic that you've been wanting to talk about. And I've stopped you all this while. Uh, that is if uh, opposition parties form a new government. So as I touched on during the early part of today's program, some of the political parties have openly declared their intention to form a post-election coalition. You mentioned why can't they do that now. Let me say to you that uh, the current uh, laws don't allow them to enter into a coalition from the start. This means that they are willing to unite for the ultimate purpose of having sufficient numbers to form government post-election. As a public and political affairs specialist, how do you gauge the sense of unity when it comes to opposition parties? Is that call for unity a reality or is it a myth? Shashi, I'll be very blunt here. You know, and this is, as I said, this is coming out from people. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, talking, uh, talking to from Korovuto. He attended uh, nearly all the meetings of uh, Unity Party, Fiji Labour Party, and um, uh, NFP. Uh, they're basically saying, all parties are saying the same thing. They are saying the same thing about the economy. They are saying the same thing about uh, the uh, various situations in the country, what they will, how they will address it. They are saying the same thing. Only different wordings are used. If they, are, if they have the same goal, if they are talking about the same thing, then they, why are they are fighting separately? Why? Because it's not class of policies, it's class of personalities. And if they are not able to, uh, you know, uh, get, uh, you know, sort of get together before elections, people are questioning how we expect them to work together after the election. If they really care about the people, if they really care about the country, they should be uniting before the election. Because everybody is saying the same thing. Narume is saying the same thing. Biman is saying the same thing. Chaudhary is saying the same thing. If you have the same policy, basically same policy, then what is the issue? It's it's the conflict of interest. It's a clash of personalities. Uh, it, it is the clash of personalities be, uh, between different political leaders. And I, I'm sad to say, uh, if they cannot unite before the election, how can we expect them to unite after the election? Their unity, their confidence in uh, the voters must be restored before the election and not after the election. Well, this, for one... uh, as I said before earlier in the program, this uh, I don't know what papers this memorandum of understanding says. Nothing, you know, th there are laws that al uh, doesn't allow government, uh, you know, to find a uh, to fight the elections together. But there are other ways to come out of it. You know, every uh, everyone doesn't have to take their party to the election. I know that some of the parties are old, but there has to be, you know, a, a couple of uh, I think two years ago, Jagat Karunatne, you know, the guy. Um, it's a Freedom Alliance party. He offered his party. He said, you know, you guys park your party, come and join. Let's find our one party. There were a lot of interest initially, but then, you know, I think some parties thought they, that they will do well, so they pulled out, you know, and I, it's a sad thing. But, you know, it, it's time leaders should get together. I, I am willing to host them, you know, come home, sit down, you know, start talking, find a way that, you know, we, we don't slaughter each other. And, you know, find a way to work on a common ground. You know, even, you know, I appeal to the prime minister of this country that maybe the time is right, you know, to get everybody together and talk together, you know, talk and, you know, move this country forward. And I think the only answer to our country is government of national unity, nothing else. Nothing. We are so divided a country. And, you know, the opposition parties don't realize their division is causing division among our people. 
because people don't know where to align themselves. You know, sometimes it is a real fact that some of the political party leaders go to the meetings and criticize each other. You know, our voters are not stupid. You know, when, you know, a political party leader goes and uh, criticizes another political party leader, what message we are sending to the voters. So I appeal to the opposition party. Time has not run out. You know, if you have the goodwill, we can make things happen. Uh, otherwise, you know, the voters, uh, you know, are very skeptical uh, talking about uh, post-election uh, alliance when you can't get together pre-election. Well, let me differ slightly from you. One of the major hurdles that any political party has is to get through that threshold first. So once the election results come in, and once parties know that they've crossed that threshold, depending on the number of seats that they will um, uh, gather from that election result, that's where the real trade-off is going to start in terms of parties trying to unite, trying to get the numbers, and trying to, for once, think on that level platform to either change the government or face the peril of another four years of Fiji first. What do you say to that? We couldn't do it in 2014. We couldn't do it in 2018. And I'm skeptical about 2022. If we All don't, right, I if we I don't unite before the election, uh, I, th I, th I think, you know, the voters might at the end decide, you know, that this is not the thing they want. So I think it's very important. I think there is a way it can do, they can be done. So I appeal to the opposition, you know, get your personalities parked somewhere. Look at the interests of the country. Look at the interests of the people. People have a lot of expectation from you from you, and live up to the expectation of the people. Find a way. What do you then think can get the opposition together to send a message to the people of Fiji that they stand united for a common purpose and that is for the good of the nation as a whole? What is it, that one it is, thing? That you know, I'm, I'm not an expert, but, you know, through my experience uh, seeing the country's politi politics, uh, political uh, development, I think some of the political parties uh, should realize, you know, that, they, that, that they, all they will do is divide the votes. And it, it, it is on the party leadership to look at the reality, to look at the past elections, and then, you know, decide what needs to be done. But I, I'm telling you, there is, uh, there is a need for the opposition to unite, send a message of unity, and send a message of hope. Otherwise, I don't think people will have hope. By getting closer to the election, I think uh, people will, 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 get, will lose a lot of interest with uh, all these political parties approaching the same electoral and, you know, talking about the same thing. Now, in your political journey, you have been a member of the Sodelpa Party. One of their platforms uh, is to reintroduce the Great Council of Chiefs uh, back in the political landscape of Fiji. The population is somewhat divided on that issue because there is a thought that should the GCC be brought back uh, with the same standing, uh, while something that they should come back, but more as a symbolic institution. One of my guests uh, actually on this program suggested that the GCC should have a role of, uh, such as the House of Lords in the UK. What are your thoughts on the reinstatement of the Great Council of Chiefs and what role do you think they should be given? You know, my personal opinion is it is for the Fijian people, the Aitoki people, to decide in what form and shape they want their GCC. But uh, as you look at it now, Fijian people don't have a voice. We have uh, like Sanatan Dram, we have uh, Sikh uh, Sabha, Sangat and all the but Fijian people don't have a voice. I think GCC is important, uh, but they should not have any constitutional powers. You know, previously we had uh, when in times of uh, instability, you know, um, uh, GCC used to step in as a de facto government. Uh, they would make a lot of decision on the behalf of the country. I think those things should go. But as I said, uh, the decision is on the Fijian people to decide how they want their uh, how they want them uh, how they want represented. Already right, you've spoken of unity. Let me suggest another possible scenario to you. While people are talking about the opposition parties forming a coalition with others in opposition, there could possibly be a scenario that after the results 
are tabulated on election night, no one party has a clear majority. One simply cannot therefore count out that the Fiji First Party could also make attempts to enter into a coalition arrangement with another opposition party. Now, would you support such a move if the Fiji First Party joined forces with an opposition party to form a coalition to give them the majority to form government again? That is not the decision for me to make, and I don't think I'm qualified to make the decision. It will be entirely upon the political parties. No, 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 because stop. I, I'm, not I, asking, I, I'm not asking you about your decision. I'm just asking you for your opinion whether you'd support such a move uh, that the Fiji First Party enters into a coalition arrangement with some other opposition party to form government. Would you, you support know, such a not, move? Again, Sashi, it is not my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. Once the election result is known, it, the onus is on the political parties. And obviously, they'll have memorandum of understanding. So it is on the political parties. There'll be a lot of horse trading going on. We have seen it before. And, you know, I'm not, I am not. won't be surprised. We'll see it again. But it is entirely on the political parties who get elected, who make it to the parliament to decide which is the best uh, arrangement they could have. I think my opinion here doesn't count. It is actually, at the end of the day, it is on the parties that get uh, make it to the parliament to decide how they want to form the coalition. Obviously, right, so. I, obviously, I think there'll be a lot of uh, host trading going on. People will discuss things, you know, the, I think that, you know, uh, we might have an election result where one cannot dictate what the other wants. Uh, they might, as I said, there'll be a lot, lot of host trading, but this is something for uh, the political parties who make to the parliament to decide. Not, and I, and I think, don't, I don't think my opinion matters here. All right. So if uh, the Fiji First Party joined with uh, Sodelpa, formed government, um, you'll accept that as the vote of the people? It is our leaders who have decided it. Uh, as I said, my opinion doesn't count. If uh, the, it is the people, the, it is the uh, parties that get elected to the parliament, they decide, you know, they will do the host trading. And if they, they decide that's the best arrangement they could have, so be it. All right. Uh, again, I respect your opinion. Now, given that the Fiji First Party have been labeled as a two-man team at the top, while the rest of the team just uh, toes the line, what would become of uh, an opposition party a partner in that coalition, the scenario that I just gave you? Will they just be a token player in government, or do you think the Fiji First Party will give I, their I partner... Don't, I, Sashi, really, I don't think the, uh, uh, the parties that will get elected uh, to the parliament will be so gullible that they allow, allow themselves to be, you know, spectators. You know, if now none of the party enters the parliament clear majority, obviously things will be quite different because the, the survival will, of the government will be based on the other member, other partner. So I know I, I don't think uh, that scenario will arise, uh, Shashi. All right, let's talk about your candidature. If you're going to stand for elections, uh, I observe you've been part of uh, two two political parties. Um, it may seem you've not found your true political home yet. But uh, my question to you is, will you be joining any political party anytime soon? Uh, I'll be very frank. You know, I want to be part of unity, not part of the division. Uh, my, uh, uh, my view is that we need people outside the parliament as well. Uh, a, lot, a lot of hard work needs to be done outside the parliament. Uh, but I will not stand for election if there is no unity in the opposition. I am... I'm, uh, close to all the political parties, and uh, given the current scenario, I don't think I am, I'll offer myself uh, to become part of a, a, a division. I, I stand for unity, and if uh, the parties unite, uh, you find me in the forefront. Uh, if not, then I think I can help from outside. When you talk of unity, what do you mean by that? All political parties in the opposition uniting as one force? Yes, exactly. Otherwise, there is no hope. I'm, I have repeated it so many times, Sashi. Uh, Post-election arrangement doesn't give hope to people. It's the pre-election uh, uh, arrangement that will give hope to voters. So in one of your March postings on your Facebook page, you had declared that you would contest the 2022 elections and that you would announce it in two weeks' time. Several months have passed now, so do I take it that you've changed your mind, as you've said, Unless there's a unity of parties, you just are not going to come to the forefront. 
look, Shashi, if I would have joined a political party, I wouldn't be sitting here and talking to you so openly. Uh, you know, if I was a member of a political party or uh, declared a candidate, if I've been talking, I, you know, the, you know, I could be in serious trouble. So uh, looking at, uh, I did declare, I'll become, uh, you know, I'll declare it. But given the split, I think at the moment I, I can reach out to more people by being independently assessing the situation and speaking out. And I think, you know, it's this moment I align myself with a party, then I'll be speaking as a politician. At the moment, I'm speaking for Fiji as a Fiji citizen. Have you been approached by political parties to contest under their banner for this forthcoming election? Uh, besides Fiji Fest, nearly all of them. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, this seems uh, like know, a... you know, but, uh, and really, Shashi, you know, I, I feel privileged uh, that, you know, uh, all leaders party have asked me to come in, you know, uh, join hands and well, now let's, let's contest. But if my thing is, my, my view is always that we must unite and, you know, leave up to the expectation of the people. All right. Uh, this seems like a crucial general election for Fiji in more ways than one. What is your message to the voting public in Fiji? This would be a good message because, as you say, you are not aligned to any political party. So what is your message to the electorate in Fiji? I have only one message. This election is crucial. Vote for Fiji. Your vote must go to Fiji and you must vote for a candidate who will best save the interests of the country. Uh, don't think about yourself. Uh, don't think about your interests. Think about Fiji's interests and future of our future generation. And let's vote for Fiji. All right. Well said. Uh, indeed. Well, Nirmal, uh, you've now taken part in your first uh, SSTP program. Yeah, and it was a long yeah. one too, I understand. Well, do you have any remarks on the SSTP interview that you've just participated in besides the length of the program? Yeah, uh, the only thing I would say, uh, let me, since we have taken so much time, let me add here. Whatever I have said, uh, it came out from my heart and it was for Fiji. I didn't mean to insult anybody or undermine any political party, whether government or uh, uh, the opposition. Basically, this is what Fiji feels. And I'm independently saying this without any affiliation, without any um, uh, negativity towards anybody. This is the genuine feeling of the people. And I'm here just as a medium of expressing that openly. Uh, the, uh, the, the STC program, I hope you can, uh, you know, it, it, this is seen to be anti-government uh, program, uh, you know, because uh, looking, looking at the audience, uh, people uh, would think it is an anti-government. I would urge you to get somebody from the government side as well. I, th I think you are trying. You have uh, sent invitations, you know, to, but, you know, keep trying. You know, maybe a time will come, uh, the government side would decide, okay, this is a good forum. Let's, uh, you have got membership, good number of listeners. So we'll try to, I hope uh, someday they will tell us, accept the offer and, you know, come on your, uh, uh, come, uh, on your program and offer their side of the story. I take exception with the fact that you say this is an anti-government uh, program. No, no, what I'm sure. no, 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 let me finish. Give me the time to finish. I take exception to that because I have time and time again stated that I can only work with, within the confines of the guests I have. I have time and time again invited, I've sent invitations to the Prime Minister's Department, to the Attorney General, to his office, and to a number of ministers and permanent secretaries. If it is the choice of the Fiji First Government not to participate in this program, I will only interview members of the opposition parties or any political parties, or even people like your good self who have Fiji at heart. So my invitation is open, and I don't take it lightly that you call it an anti-government program. I, 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 I mentioned perception. So, see, I said there is a perception, you know, because yeah, I understand okay. you are trying your best to get the government. What I'm saying, keep trying. Yeah, well, the invitation's out there. If they want to come on to this program, they know how to contact me. Well, Nirmal, we've come to the end of the program. Thank you very much, Dhanavad. A very, very big thank you to you for being chief guest in today's program. It has been a pleasure to listen to somebody with a, a different approach to things. And uh, thank you for discussing the various topics with me. I wish you have a wonderful day. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being chief guest on episode 31 of SSTP.
Pleasure is all mine, Shashi, and God bless Fiji and its people. I know good days are ahead. Uh, let's pray for Fiji. All right. Thank you, and uh, have a blessed Sunday. Thank, thank you, Nirmal Singh Chima. Well, there you have it, folks. That's uh, our program for episode 31. In just a moment, I will discuss with you who our chief guest for next week is. I thank all the viewers who have taken time to provide the positive feedback with regards to this program. A number of you have uh, been sending your comments uh, on uh, Facebook Live. I'll get to those comments uh, a, a little later on. A big thank you to my regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, for his input in the program today. To my SSDP team, a very big thank you as well. Now, let me um, reveal the name of our chief guest for next week. Our chief guest for next week will be a person whose articles I have thoroughly enjoyed reading in the Fiji Times. She is, of course, none other than Lemba Seni Numbo. Miss Numbo is the presently the General Secretary of the National Federation Party and has served in that role since 2019. She has the distinction of being the first Etho K and woman to ever hold this role in the party's 59-year legacy as the oldest political party in Fiji and probably the Pacific. Last Friday, Ms. Numbo was also announced as a provisional candidate for the National Federation Party. So next Sunday, on episode 32 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point, I'm really looking forward to a stimulating interview with our chief guest, Ms. Lamba Seni Numbo, that should make for an interesting interview as we have a lot to discuss with our chief guest. So until next Sunday, I wish you all a very safe and happy week. In closing, I'll leave you with this quote from Lyndon B. Johnson who said, This right to vote is the basic without which all others are meaningless. It gives people, people as individuals, control over their destinies. I repeat that, this right to vote is the basic without which all others are meaningless. It gives people, people as individuals, control over their destinies. That quote from Lyndon B. Johnson. Well, that's it for episode 31 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Till the next program, I am Sashi Singh, bidding you goodbye, namaste, and ni samove. Goodbye, world.